I am Thomas, the Officer Promotional Affairs of the NWS Committee. Of the NWS Committee. For this committee, I made sure we had a nice social media page and I made lots of posters and I made the banner for this amazing symposium. You might have gotten to know about this symposium through one of my posters, which is really exciting. I'm really excited as well about this symposium because we will have lots of amazing talks regarding limits and mathematics. I hope you enjoy the symposium as much as I will. Hello everyone, my name is Mike Overmas in the NWS committee. I had the role of Officer Logistics. My main task was to arrange the location of the symposium. Of course, it was a real shame when we had to switch to an online symposium because we had a really nice location in store. However, I think our current studio really looks nice and is very well suited for a symposium. Today, I'm very excited that each one of our talks has something to do with a limit, either in a mathematical sense or in a physical sense. As such, I'm looking forward to all of the talks and I hope you are excited as well. So please have fun. Hi there, my name is Niels and this year I was part of the NWS committee. I was the one of the officers of external affairs, so my job was to get into contact with the companies and find the limit as to how much they were willing to pay to uh, cooperate with us on this symposium. Last year I was also in the symposium committee for Abacus, but unfortunately we had to cancel that one. So I'm really excited that this year we have been able to set up such a nice online event and uh, I'm sure it will be great. Hello everyone, I'm Margriet. I'm one of the officers external affairs of the NWS committee. Uh, we actually had two officers external affairs this year. Uh, this was because we didn't know what was going to be possible exactly today. So this made finding sponsors a little bit more difficult. However, we did manage to find some amazing companies to work with us. And together with them, we made this uh, amazing symposium possible, despite the uncertainty. Um, yeah, I hope you will enjoy it. I will see you there. Hey guys, I'm Matijn. I'm the treasurer of the NWS committee. I was challenged to find the limit of my budgets. I made several budgets, both for an online and an offline symposium. And after all, it became a really nice online symposium. As you can see today, we've arranged a nice studio, we arranged nice goodies for you, and we hope that you have a wonderful day. Hi, I'm Lavinia, and this year I've had the honor of being the secretary of the National Mathematics Symposium Committee. Well, while as a secretary I don't have maybe the most exciting task, I do get to now, to now do during the stream basically everything behind the screens. So while you may not see me, not see a lot of me in front of the cameras, I am doing quite a lot of work behind them. And I think that's really cool. Hi there, I'm Hugo and I was the chairman of this year's uh, NWS committee. So I had to make sure everything worked out fine in the end. But I think that was easy with all these uh, nice and motivated people together. So I think today will be uh, amazing. Yes, yeah, right. I think it will be uh, amazing too. Um, I think we had some small problems with the introduction video of all of our committee members, but many of us will be in the studio today, so you will see us all anyway, so that's quite nice. And you can meet the rest later, maybe. And um, welcome everyone to the National Mathematics Symposium 2021. Uh, I was the chairman of the committee, as said. Uh, over 100 people enrolled, so we're very glad that this online event turned out to be, uh, well, will turn out to be well visited. But I won't do the hosting myself today, but instead we have a great uh, chairman of the day, which is Tineke Wiesma. Hi, Tineke. Hey, hello. Yeah, I'm very nice that you invited me to, uh, to come here. It's a pity that not everybody can be here, but for me it's very nice to be back at uh, Twente University again. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I mean, at least people can now sit outside in the sun today. It will be very yeah, nice weather. That's, so. that, that's <laughs> an advantage. <laughs> But yeah, you're back here, you say, because you also studied yeah, here? Yeah, I, I studied here from 1984 till 1989, so that's a long time ago. But uh, And I also was uh, uh, active at uh, Abacus in that time, so when Abacus asked me to to do this, I couldn't say no. No, I, <laughs> I understand. I think you also did a board here, right, at Abacus? Yes, I did uh, two years. Uh, I, uh, I, the first year I was the secretary and the second year I was the chairman. Yeah, very nice. Oh, I, I mm -hmm. like I like that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, and, and now you study mathematics, and what did you end up doing? In uh, well, I, I 
I must say I don't use mathematics a lot anymore. I, there is still in some parts of my job some mathematics, but I work at uh, Rijkswaterstaat. Uh, Rijkswaterstaat, well, I think every Dutchman knows uh, Rijkswaterstaat, but we uh, manage the national uh, road network. And I specialized in tunnel safety and, uh, and I'm in, within tunnel safety, the, the risk analysis expert. So that has a small link with, uh, with mathematics still. Yeah, I think it's still quite connected, right? Yeah. I mean, it's fine. And, and you're not afraid that everything will be uh, super hard today? Or uh, did you freshen up on your mathematics a bit? Well, I think I will do that today a lot. <laughs> so, well, I'm, I'm very curious uh, what mathematics is about uh, now. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I think uh, many things are quite interesting. Uh, I think you, you heard what we will talk about in your very interesting talks. Uh, yes, yes, I had a, a sneak preview of some of the lectures, so I, th of present day. I, I think it will be very interesting. And I also think you chose the, the, the theme very uh, nice. Uh, first I read Find Your Limit, and I thought limit in Dutch it's limit. It's but in English, a limit has much more uh, meanings. So that is also represented in these uh, presentations that uh, there, there's a, a big variety in the subjects. And I think that's helpful that in English, uh, yeah. limit means a bit more than only limit. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I totally agree. We just had some brainstorming. We wanted some catchy three word thing. And then someone came up with this and we thought, oh, this is very smart because you can just talk about whatever you want. And then it's yeah, yeah, very nice yeah. well, if, well, if you give a limit Maybe not touch. everything, but it's almost limitless. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay, good job, good job. <laughs> so... Yeah, so, um, well, I'm very uh, curious if I can still catch up with my mathematics today, but um, I think the the presentations are quite clear, so... Um. Yeah, yeah, for, for me too. I think maybe we can go already to the announcements yes, a bit for the um, day. Well, um, well, we already know, but most of you will al also know that we have six presentations today. Uh, well, we, you, you will. Some of the names are in on the banner behind uh, behind Hugo. But um, uh, during uh, the presentations, well, most times the the, the chairman has to uh, watch that they do not exceed their time. This time, that is easy because they are all uh, recorded. So. They cannot exceed their time that much, but we can exceed our time in questions. You can ask questions in the chat. So please do that. And then after the presentations, these questions will be answered by the, the, the orator. And uh, oh, I hope we have some good questions and discussions after each uh, presentation. After every presentation, we have a break, so you have a rest, uh, take your eyes off the screen, have a cup of coffee. During the break, there will be a countdown, so it, you won't have to miss the start of the next presentation, because you can have a watch at the countdown every time. Uh, so that's the most important thing that we uh, want to ask you. Please be active and... Uh, put in some questions in the chat and during the breaks there you can also chat with the uh, companies on our uh, online expo maybe uh, Hugo you want to talk something uh, tell some more about that yeah there's just on the on the platform hop in there is some expo function and there are three companies that you can can talk to and have a chat with on there during all the breaks I think and also during the lunch break for a long time but you can also make breakout rooms during the breaks and you can talk to each other, which is also nice to discuss the, the talks a little bit. Or you can just take your eyes off the screen, which I also advise, so your eyes rest a bit. Because watching at the screen for too many hours is not very, very great. But Yeah, and yeah. the weather is nice, so you can also take your screen uh, outside in yeah, the I, I garden. Yeah, I would totally do that, yeah. <laughs> I'm afraid we have to stay inside this... Yeah, uh, yeah we have a very nice studio, <laughs> but I... <laughs> Still, it would be nice if I would just sit outside. Yeah, I'm yeah. To I totally agree with and, you. And um, well, we are at the technical university, so I don't expect too much technical problems. But I hope everything uh, will be uh, yeah, going uh, 
smoothly? Yeah, I hope so too. We, we ran a lot of tests, but we just wanted to show an introduction video, but uh, something went wrong maybe. But I, I'm very confident that everything will go smooth today. So I think it will all work out. I'm okay, okay. We're very happy and confident, so it uh, will be great. Okay, well, I, I'm glad to hear that you also, <laughs> also did some testing uh, in front. Testing is also one of the things we do uh, in uh, at Rijkswaterstaat a lot. Of so, course. Uh, um, well, good, good for you. Yeah. Um, are there any more things we want to share with our public before we start? No, I think we can go on, right? Okay, then uh, I think we can uh, start our first presentation. It's uh, a presentation of uh, Jer Jerry Spanak Spanakis. He's an uh, assistant professor at the uh, Maastricht uh, University at the Department of Data Science. And he uh, is specialized in uh, social machine uh, learning. And well, uh, he is, uh, has done some research on uh, social media. Well, we all know social media, of course, and we all uh, spend our time there. And he is going to uh, inform us how s the spread of information is, is going and how it, um, how this works and especially uh, how the spreading of fake news uh, works and what mathematics can uh, do to help to limit the uh, amount of fake news on uh, social media. And um, well, there's also some uh, mathematics uh, in this, uh, this presentation. So but I'm, I will not be able to explain that. Jeremy can uh, do uh, all that. <laughs> um, so I think, uh, Jeremy, uh, bring it on. So hi, everyone. It's Jerry. Um, I guess it's not nice that we cannot meet on site and talk to each other in real life. But you know what's been going on in the last year uh, in this world. So I'm going to try to do my best to give this talk online. And I'm going to talk about the limits of social media. So I'm an assistant professor in data mining and machine learning at Maastricht University in the very south of the Netherlands. Um, and um, why am I here to talk to you about these things today? What is my research agenda? It's revolving around what I call social machine learning. Uh, this has two main research questions. One is how we structure the unstructured. So how do we make sense of all the data and information that exists around us and specifically on the internet? And second, how to bring useful machine learning technology to the hands of non-experts. In that context, I have worked in different domains and with different people, including lawyers, clinical psychologists, artists, and also with different types of data, including tabular data like numbers, but also text and images. Um, I've also done many applied work on social media, also on building mobile apps for different purposes, uh, and also like chatbots as well for, uh, let's say, survivors of sexual harassment. So um, I'm, going to talk about, I'm going to talk about today is social media. And I guess I don't need to maybe show you this figure, which shows what kind of social media we have and what's happening in this social media every 60 seconds, right? We have 200,000 tweets, 695,000 stories on Instagram, um, 2 million swipes on, on Tinder and so on. Um, and of course, the question is, uh, it wasn't always like this in terms of size, like data never sleeps, it always gets more and more, but also in terms of context, right? Social media started as a, um, a platforms that were connecting people and they could uh, talk to each other. However, now we go on social media to get our news and not only that, we buy things and so on. Um, how did we end up here? Right, and also how that relates maybe to the uh, things I'm going to talk about today, like let's say misinformation and disinformation. Um, this is how maybe you know fake news used to be in the 90s. Then we were getting our news from newspapers, meaning that um, this was like you know typical maybe fake news uh, for the Clinton couple in this case, and the characteristics here that they were obviously hoax, and I guess not many people believed them. However, with the evolution of the internet, social media, things have changed also because everybody can post whatever they want. 
So now we now have um, satire websites like theonion.com posting news, which sometimes, at least in Greece, that has happened. They are picked up even by media, main media um, uh, outlets. Um, and also there are even more, you know, articles about um, like conspiracy theories like this one, which has been very popular since last year that Bill Gates um, uses vaccines uh, for COVID-19 for digital tracking, which, um, you know, it's kind of a funny news item. It has given us like some nice memes as well, because Bill Gates recently um, got divorced. Uh, there's this nice meme about, you know, uh, let's call all vaccinated single women in his area. Uh, but it's maybe more, you know, <laughs> uh, a bit um, serious than uh, the funny side of the story. Uh, at the same time, technology evolves and can give us like uh, some nice uh, produced uh, fakes like this one. That's a fake picture of Donald Trump. Um, also for means of propaganda and, uh, you know, showing something that's not real, everything is very easily to be fabricated, like I can be shown to tear the constitution or something, and yeah, it might look very real, or it might be that exactly um, uh, the, a piece of information, uh, some, uh, yeah, picture, let's say in this case, it might be flipped around by showing the wrong message. So in this case, it was promoted that, yeah, look, we're putting kids in cages. Um, and later on, the kid um, surprisingly appeared outside the cage just because that was taken out of context and, you know, um, the picture was taken out of context and was a clearly wrong message. So um, why social media amplify fake news and why that is a bit maybe problematic is that, um, you know, we have this dark kermit inside us, right, that says, okay, go do it, share it now, people will love it, uh, you know, don't fact check it. Right, that's a very nice, maybe uh, one region, but there are many more, right? So on the one hand, um, um, we have like things like uh, um, how far news, uh, fake news can travel, and that's very far. They also travel very quickly, so the speed is very high and also very easily, right? It's uh, just one click away. So um, what are some uh, specific cultural amplifiers is that, first of all, we have the viral nature of the internet, right? Everything on the internet can be viral in a matter of seconds and minutes. We also have the concept of filter bubbles, right? We here in the Western Europe, we don't take our news from uh, the East as the same uh, as in other countries, or we don't read about what's happening in China, or even we might read what only our friends uh, share with us on social media. There's also the concept of confirmation bias, which has also psychological uh, factors with it, that it's very easy for me to believe something that I have the bias to believe that it's true. Uh, technology, as we saw, makes creating fake so easy. At the same time, it's very time consuming to fact check, and maybe that's related um, with the fact that exactly if you share something very fast, you have this instant gratification. Um, I think there have been examples that major news provide this uh, they accidentally shared fake news, which grows the distrust on traditional media. Uh, then there's the concept of like farming and monetization. Uh, I'm going to talk more about that because I think that's important, right? We need to remember that everything on the internet is about the clicks, which brings money and power to some people. Um, and also, right, uh, there is this weaponization of uh, news. We have the cases of, you know, uh, the Russian interference in um, uh, Western elections. Uh, I talked about monetization. I want to talk also about what's happening in social media and the web in general from that perspective. I think that's a story from maybe you were unborn. Um, maybe you were the unborn baby um, in this case. But there was this couple back in 2001 that they wanted to auction their right to name their unborn baby. Uh, and of course, that was followed by many, many more stories, very recent ones. This is from 2013. Somebody wanted to tattoo porn websites, and he did it, as you can see, uh, on his face so that his kids wouldn't starve. So we have this concept of, you know, human banners and human ads. Um, and that brings me to Instagram. And maybe um, uh, you have seen some of these people and influencers like Nikki Tutorials. In the left hand post, she has this promotion like, do you want to win? Uh, here is this giveaway. You need to follow this account. And also, if you use my name, you can get a discount code. 
So there's clearly some disclosure uh, done here, but uh, th there's some collaboration between Nikki tutorials and the brands. Is that properly disclosed? Not really. On the right hand side, you can see PewDiePie. I'm pretty sure some of you know them from their videos online. And the um, idea here is that, again, there is a hashtag ad somewhere there. So this is clearly an ad. And at the same time, there is this paid partnership, if you see at the top of the post, meaning that there is the proper disclosure. But the question is, how many of these are actually disclosed? Right? So, um, and the question related to misinformation and disinformation becomes that, is what I'm saying real? in the sense that if you see somebody promoting a lipstick or something and tagging the brand, is it because they actually like uh, the lipstick and they really want you to use it or it's because they're getting paid to tell you, please use this lipstick because yeah, it's perfect for you. Uh, of course, this concept can be not only for products, but can also be for hotels, right? Um, if I stay at the hotel and say, look, this is a five-star hotel, hmm, was it that I paid for it and I was really happy about it or was it just, uh, yeah, there is an agreement. Uh, and of course, in some cases, like with Chiara Ferrani, who is apparently a very popular influencer and everybody wants her to advertise things. Um, what happened with her wedding is that Italia offered her a full flight to bring her guests. Uh, and I think in that case, there was a barter agreement in the sense that there was just exchange of appearances. What I want to say here is that sometimes it's very hard to identify when there is a monetary um, uh, transaction or when there's just a barter agreement about exchange of appearances. Um, however, there is this paradigm shift on the internet, right, which um, makes um, things challenging, is that anybody can create content, right? You don't have to be a journalist to create news. You don't have to be an advertiser to advertise products. And of course, um, you know, all has uh, the uh, bottom line that people want just to make money. Apparently, that's a very popular Google search. Um, and that brings me to what I'm going to talk about today, which is this information disorder, maybe spectrum, which spans from, you know, a maybe unintentional misinformation uh, or even, you know, when satire is taken seriously and goes all down the way to uh, the intention to harm where there is this malicious, um, uh, let's say, uh, intention. Uh, and of course, in the middle, we have the disinformation, which exactly covers what we call maybe fake news. Or you can even say that some cases of influencer marketing are there because there is no disclosure. So um, why should we care about these things? Uh, first of all, I'm pretty sure you heard already many times already about them, um, uh, let's say, taking advantage of data in order to craft fake news and not just manipulate voters, but I would say generally manipulate behaviors. We had stories about the Russian uh, bots affecting our election systems. Uh, Tim Berners-Lee said that platforms like Facebook have a role in weaponizing what we intended to do or what he intended to do with the web. Um, at the same time, there are cases that um, we cannot even intervene when there are WhatsApp messages, right, which is a private, let's say, um, communication platform that cause mob killings. Um, and of course, like maybe the anti-vaccine movement, which has uh, reappear diseases like the measles in many countries in the uh, in Europe, and um, what the World Health Organization called about COVID-19 is that it's kind of maybe the first infodemic we have to deal with, not just the pandemic. If you want some national examples, maybe you have heard of Famke Luise. Famke Luise uh, initially she was paid by the Dutch government right to to promote masks and mask users to her followers. However, at some point she joined this movement like it do need mermay and she said that yeah that's it I cannot take it anymore. So I guess there is this concept of you know uh, either if it's news or if it's uh, some people promoting something like influencers what is true or not. Um, so what I'm going to talk, to talk about the next 25 minutes or so is what technology can do um, to help alleviate some of these uh, problems. And I'm going to talk about content-based approaches that exactly use the image and the text, and of course, any kind of analysis we do. Uh, so what we actually see, write, and read in a post on social media. I'm going to talk about network-based approaches, like how propagation structures can help um, detect uh, this disinformation uh, fast. 
a hybrid or mixed approach as well. I'm going to outline the limit of approaches on the way, right, what works or maybe what doesn't work yet, what we need, um, and also outline some challenges for the future. Now, first of all, uh, especially for fake news, I have to say that there is a very broad and very, uh, you know, uh, nicely developed fact-checking landscape with many websites and organizations that exactly do that from different perspectives. We have the factcheck.org, the PolitiFact, um, and many more websites that exactly do some amazing work. The thing is that, you know, can we fact check every claim in the world? And here the numbers come very devastating to us just because we can see that, for example, 50% of the spread of fake news happens in the first 10 minutes, right? In even less than 10 minutes. That's very fast, right? For even reacting to, okay, I found it, how do I stop it? Uh, and also like uh, fake news travel six times faster uh, on Twitter compared to the truth, right? Again, these are crazy numbers, right? So uh, what can technology do here? Um, I'm going to talk about Twitter because it's also what we based our work on, but of course can be extended on other social media. So on Twitter, uh, we can model four information sources, right? And this is the message, the user, the topic, and the propagation. This is from a paper from 2011. It was the first one to model, okay, let's see what we can um, study on Twitter. Uh, the um, message can be used to extract different features, right? This is what we do in machine learning. We take uh, data and we try to engineer features. What are these features, right? They are exactly taking advantage of what we can see in the message. They might have, have features like the length of characters, the length of words, does it contain a question mark, does it contain an exclamation mark, and even more, right? Um, does it contain a popular domain of the top 10, top 10, the top 100, and so on? Does it contain a stock symbol? Is it a retweet? Is it posted on a weekday? Does it contain more positive or negative sentiment words, and so on? Uh, at the same time, we have information about the user, right? Every post on Twitter is posted by somebody, an account, and then you can have some information about that. How many followers they have, how many people they follow, is it verified, do they have a description, a URL, and so on. Um, then we have this, what we call the topic, or maybe topical information, which is maybe goes a bit deeper into, um, yeah, what is maybe some information about the, um, the tweet, either on the level of the, um, let's say, um, the user or uh, some aggregation level, let's say. So you can say that, okay, um, let's take a fraction of tweets that contain question mark about a specific user, right? Or if a specific user, um, yeah, uh, what is the average sentiment score of that? Or what is the average number of the tweets? or what is the, um, for specific tweets, let's say, how many uh, numbers of distinct authors they might have and so on. So we're going a bit deeper into the analysis. And finally, we have the propagation. Um, some of the previous measures, but also here, this specifically are related exactly to how they are propagated, right? If I start a tweet now, somebody might retweet me and then somebody might retweet that person. So there is a, let's say, propagation tree and they can measure all this information with what we know from maybe graph theory, like how many um, uh, initial tweets I have, so what's the degree of that root, what's the maximum subtree, degree, depth, and so on, so all this information. Uh, so this is what we can do, right? And then if we have some information about what items are uh, real or fake, we can actually model uh, what is um, build a classifier to identify, okay, this news item now is fake or not. Now, um, what we did in one of our papers with Marion Myers and Gerhard Weiss is that we took data from fake news net. They used data from PolitiFact, um, obviously political news, and uh, Gossip Cop. Gossip Cop contains fake and real news. Obviously, they are a bit um, more gossipy, not political news. And this is the pipeline of you know, getting the data and creating uh, the propagation graphs because we want it exactly to study in this case. Uh, what happens if I completely ignore the content and I just focus on the propagation structures, right? So this is the tweet. And then I find who retweeted that 
when I get all the retweets, then I try to create the graphs. And this uh, asterisk there in the create graphs in the yellowish uh, frame, it shows that this is a process which is not very easy. Why? Because ideally the data would look like, th like this, right? If you have an item about, let's say, Donald Trump, then you see which user started the tweet, who users retweeted, Ideally, some people retweet because they saw it from a specific user and then they retweeted themselves and so on. Also, the same news item might be shared by different users. So one news item might have, let's say, different, as we call them, cascades. Um, now, what are some challenges here? And this is maybe one of the issues that how we have access, let's say, to data is that the uh, let's say the, all the retweets you can get from the Twitter database, they all point to the retweet. So actually, we don't have very really accurate information about who retweeted whom. Of course, you can uh, try to approximate this retweet, let's say, uh, cascade by using the time information and who follows who, but it's not going to be very accurate. So um, what we did is exactly based on previous literature, we extracted manually features uh, some of them related to users, like for uh, a retweet, how many uh, followers a user has or how many people they're following. Um, and then for the network, let's say, um, what is the news item lifetime? So what is the first and last tweet in that? What is the retweet percentages? How many total tweets there are or how many total retweets there are? What's the percentage of posts in the first hour or not? We found that the first eight are the significant ones to discriminate between fake and real news. And the three uh, on the bottom, they are the not significant ones. So what we did is that we first tried with a simple classification setup where exactly we assume this graph structure where every retweet retweets the original tweet, um, which is a simplification, of course, because it's not true. And here, what we have is that we are achieving 87% accuracy on exactly identifying if an item is true or fake, just based on this propagation structure, right? So not dealing with the content itself, which is very important, right? Because we can see how exactly this propagation structure evolves. Now, uh, the most important features were exactly the news item lifetime and also the average number of followers of people that were retweeting. Uh, some other uh, findings also most in agreement with previous literature is that exactly real news uh, take six times as long to reach 1500 users. Um, in general, they reach less users overall and are less retweeted and also propagators of real news have more followers. Now, um, expanding this work, what we did is that we tried to take into account the detection threshold, right? Because the previous work doesn't assume that, okay, what happens um, in the first hour or in the first 10 hours, right? It assumes that we have the full evolution of the graph. So in the second work, mainly done by Kostya in his thesis, we said, okay, let's take a detection deadline of, let's say, 30 minutes, like we can see in the figure. And then we say that, okay, how many tweets and retweets we had in that uh, interval. And we take the time information, like if a tweet was started, of course, at time zero, then it was retweeted after 10 minutes, after 12 minutes, after 13 minutes, and we put them in a sequence, right? This is the, sequ the source tweet, and then the retweets are one after the other. So we create sequences, and then in these sequences, we put some representation characteristics some features of each user, right? So X1 is the user that posted the original tweet, X2 is the user that retweeted first, and then so on. So we have uh, sequences, let's say, of cascades, um, and then we pass them through a um, recurrent neural network. That's a gated recurrent unit network in this case. We have a pooling layer, feed forward layer, and then we predict whether the uh, cascade is uh, real or fake. Now, remember I told you that a, a news item can have several cascades based on how many times I a user started the original tweet. So of course, here we classify the cascades and then with the majority voting, we classify a news item. Why is that useful? Because it can give us this nice, let's say, um, accuracy versus detection deadline trade-offs. And here in this case, um, we see also maybe compared to the work we did uh, before, which was 
not take into account detection deadline, is that um, yeah, how fast we can reach, let's say, a good level of accuracy. And let's say a good level of accuracy in this case could be at least, I would say, 80%. So in the case of PolitiFact, that is 16 hours. In the case of uh, Gossip Cop, that's 12 hours. If you think, of course, about um, yeah, the, the speeds we talked before, that you know, uh, the news have reached people in you know uh, 10 minutes or so, uh, 16 hours is too much, right? So that's really out of the blue. But you know, again, um, it's one of the limitations we have um, about exactly uh, fact checking uh, everything. Now. Um, as I talked already, right, I said that what we do is that we engineer features, right? So we take all these tweets, these cascades, and we extract features. And that's a very painful process because you have to take the data and look, okay, what can I extract from that? How do I take the number of followers, number of retweets, the first hour, and so on? Uh, so that is a very painful process. And we end up with all many features, and then we need to check how many of these are significant or not. And the big question here is that can I feed the graph directly into a machine learning model? And here, right, there's very much room for doing amazing research if you are interested in, right, also because you can combine things from graph theory uh, about representation learning on networks. Um, that's from a tutorial in 2018. So it's very recent work. And people, what are trying to do is that, let's say, if I have this network, the input graph, let's say, uh, where this is maybe the connection of users on a social network or the retweets or whatever you want it, then can I find a representation of A that I can feed into a network directly? And the idea here is that we can have embeddings for these nodes, so the presentations in a lowered space based on the information they have from the neighbors. Right? So in this case, A is a neighbor of D, B, and C, and then B is a neighbor of A and C. So can I take this information to find this nice, let's say, uh, robust representations of networks. Uh, and that is wonderful because then we don't need to extract vectors anymore. We don't need to flatten everything to create sequences like explained before. But what we can do is that we can create graph, let's say, based, let's say, neural networks in this case. That's a paper from 2016 from Max Welling. Um, and then we can directly feed them and apply concepts we know from neural networks like convolution into graphs. And of course, nothing is limiting us here. We can have an output which is a graph. In our case, we tried it with the classification of fake news or not based on this graph propagation. We don't get promising results. I think it's mostly because we didn't have the accurate representation of the graph on Twitter. But there is still here low room for further research, right? Also, from a mathematical point of view, right? How do we take advantage of whatever we know from graph theory? Uh, and this is like the graph neural networks direction is something very promising if you are interested in it. Now, um, this is maybe one question, right, about fake or real news. I guess um, uh, another topic here is how do users in general, right, engage on social media with news items? And there has been research, um, uh, very recent actually, that studies that on different platforms. So this is this paper that exactly studied uh, Facebook spreading of news. And what they actually found is that maybe something that, um, yeah, I guess people wouldn't expect, um, that um, indeed users interacted more and engaged more with FATIC posts, like containing, uh, that means um, containing like, you know, sentimental info and so on, uh, about look at this puppy or something. Um, compared to health misinformation, right? This is kind of um, um, a correlation graph of, uh, let's say, how the total number of interactions is correlated with the topic, right? Um, and you can see that indeed the FATIC posts have a high number of correlation, but the health misinformation is kind of in the um, uh, lower negative scale. Um, now, what we can do in order exactly to see what drives engagement high on social media for users and how we can you know model that we can take advantage of the information uh, we see in the news right and here again similar to what we discussed about twitter here we can have like uh, the news contain like the words the message uh, so the actual content they can have patterns like sometimes titles can be like can x do y or this maybe um, 
uh, fishy links, like, you know, you won't believe what happened when X or something. Uh, and of course, like, they can be about topics in specific sections, like sports and politics. And this is from a paper from um, Labrianidis et al. Uh, that they did it for da Danish uh, news, and they found that these are the top, let's say, unigrams that uh, predict high engagement, right? There are some names, let's say, about Magnussen or Trump, but also some dictic references like about here or even, uh, you know, uh, pronouns like you and so on. So what we're doing right now with one of my students, Pietro, is that we follow 54 Dutch national media outlets on Facebook and we have data from 2020 and 2021. And want to predict what Facebook calls, um, you know, overperforming score. So what is overperforming score? What you the information you have from Facebook platform, CrowdTangle, which is the way to get access to data from Facebook for research purposes, is that there is this news article, right? Uh, so there is this uh, three-liner about describing the news item. Then there is the actual news item with some picture. And then there are the interactions, right? So based on this, I guess the virality of that, Facebook computes this overperforming score, which is defined as, you know, uh, will that perform better or worse than the actual post of this uh, web page. Um, so it's kind of an indication of how much engagement it caused. So what we're trying to do here is that, yeah, we're going to do it for, um, yeah, uh, different, uh, let's say, um, features of this news. So what we have done so far is that we have extracted different topics and we um, yeah, uh, put them in eight categories, kind of broad, and these are maybe the top 15 words from each category. Of course, there is a category other which covers everything else. Um, and then there is the coronavirus topic, as you can imagine. There is a category about politics, something about gossip and social in general, about kids and family, about the weather, as you can imagine. And then we want to see, okay, um, if we build a classifier that predicts engagement based on the topic of the messages, uh, based on the characteristics of when it was posted and so on, uh, can we see what drives engagement and this overperforming score? Surprisingly enough, um, or maybe not surprisingly enough, you uh, see that here in this figure, uh, coronavirus is leading engagement up, not very highly, but still it's kind of a positive indication. Um, maybe surprisingly enough, in this case, the weather has a very negative uh, engagement down. I guess we're all sick and tired of that summer. Um, and also, right, we did the same for the, uh, the, the monthly. So the first plot is about the 12 months and uh, when engagement was higher or not. And maybe not surprisingly enough, we can see that towards March, uh, the engagement was at the peak. It started dropping and became quite negative, I guess, in the summer, which might make sense. And after that, it was like almost, uh, yeah, um, non-existent. I guess people were very tired after that for coronavirus, right? Um, also engagement throughout the day, similar maybe expect observations that after six o'clock, the engagement is quite uh, negative throughout the day is more positive. Again, we're still analyzing these results. Uh, hopefully have more robust results soon. Now, I'm going to take you from news to influencers. Uh, and um, this is work we're doing with Taj Bertalia and Karina Guanza. Uh, and the goal is, you know, to protect consumers. We're all consumers on social media from undisclosed ads, right? What is an undisclosed ad is here we see Kylie Jenner, maybe you know her. Um, she's, you know, just another day at the office and she's wearing a casual dress, I guess, and making photocopies, right? And um, there, there's a tag of the brand. And of course, the question is, I mean, did she really dress up like that to just go to work because she thinks that's a very comfortable dress? Or is it because, you know, there is some agreement, right? So what can we do here, right? Um, again, we can extract information from the post. So this is a case of a person, you know, posting that I'm happy in Nevada with my absolute vodka here. Look at the bottle. Um, and um, we can extract the text from the caption, but we can see indeed information like if there is a brand 
uh, covered or not. Um, and also the image, right? The image can be seen either as the image itself or as the accessibility caption, which offers information about what the image may contain. Um, now, what we do in our case, because obviously you might ask, how do you know if a post is disclosed or not, if they are not saying it? And this is what exactly we're going to take in advantage in this dataset we're building. So we have almost 400K posts by almost 400 influencers from four countries. Uh, and we also organize them based on the number of followers they have, like in micro influencers and mega influencers. This kind of some statistics about the posts, like uh, most of them are from, Bra uh, from Brazil. Brazil have a very large influencer industry, but also, um, yeah, Germany has the smallest one. Perhaps the reason for that is that the regulation framework in Germany is very different about ads. Now, what we see here in the top, let's say, hashtags that uh, were posted with these posts is that there is this hashtag, uh, you know, about uh, the hashtags about topics like fashion, fitness, lifestyle. But then the third one is this hashtag ad, right? That means that the influencer acknowledges that, you know what, this is an ad. Uh, and that is, you know, really helpful because then we can take all these disclosure hashtags together with the paid partnership, um, you know, acknowledgements, like when there is a sponsored agreement, and then construct a data set. In our case, this was like almost 11.5 thousand um, uh, about disclosed posts, right? So we can use this as a training set for identifying which of the rest posts might contain an ad or not. Um, now, um, what are the challenges here is that, of course, right, how do you uh, discriminate between endorsement and barter, right? So if I say that, look, I'm having a nice day with um, my favorite beer, whatever that is, King Malbec, um, and then how do I know that there's a financial agreement that this is an endorsement, right, because I'm getting paid, or if it's a barter, right? It's just an exchange of appearances that, you know, I'm just getting the beer because I'm offering something else. This is the real challenge here. That's what we're working currently on. What I can tell you is that um, we're following a multimodal approach, like we process the text and the image separately, and then we concatenate them. That's based on architecture from uh, a recent paper on exactly uh, profiling in influencer marketing. So we take the Instagram post, we separate the text and the image. Uh, the text is based, is processed through BERT, that's the Google pre-trained language model, and the image is processed via the inception model, that's the Google pre-trained image model, and then we want to outcome to predict, first of all, if the post is sponsored or not. Again, this is ongoing work, hopefully soon we'll have more results. So um, just to start wrapping it up, I guess the big question here is that, you know, can we win the social media battle? And of course, that's a question that maybe doesn't have a clear answer. But what I can tell you here is that we really need to cooperate all the different stakeholders from the social media companies to government regulators, to journalists, fact checkers, but also researchers, right? What I can tell you here is that, for example, the Finnish example is very good in this case. Finland is really winning the war on fake news. Um, they have really done it also through, you know, interventions in education, but also to, for different types of um, uh, access to people and how people can be educated, even if they are older or not. Um, so some takeaways, right? So misinformation and disinformation like, can be on different levels. It can be on news, it can be politicized, it can be also what we call spam or word of mouth on steroids right, uh, especially for influencer marketing. Technology can help limit the spread and also raise awareness, but also assist people in fact checking, right? Technology by itself cannot really solve the problem, right? It can assist into alleviating maybe some of the consequences. At the same time, some of the challenges that appear for the future are, first of all, that social media changed a lot, right? We used to have Twitter, which was only text-based, and now we have like TikTok, which is video based. So how do we process that effectively? Access to research data is a bit problematic, as I mentioned. We don't have exactly the accurate snapshot of what is existing on social media, but maybe what we get as researchers. At the same time, we not need to forget that any solution we have needs to be time proof. The fact that I confirmed that, yeah, look, after 16 hours, I found that this is a fake news. 
is it fast enough or not? Uh, and also, right, don't forget about the main um, outcome here is that, of course, okay, as I detect that, then what am I supposed to do with that? Uh, right, so we, we need to do everything in the context of supporting still free speech because it's still like um, social media, so people should be able to express themselves. Uh, and with that, I think uh, I would like to thank you for having me, and I'm happy to take any questions and uh, participate in a nice discussion with you. Thanks. Well, thank you, Jerry, and uh, good to have you now also in the studio. Uh, at least we see you in the studio. So uh, thank you for this uh, presentation. Uh, well, sorry about the false start, but the advantage of that is that uh, everybody who slept late uh, <laughs> was still in time for the for the restart of the presentation. So. And uh, I was very pleased to hear that there is research going on on uh, how to limit the fake news because, well, I think fake news is a serious threat of our society uh, now. So very pleased to hear that uh, mathematics is uh, going on in the fake news. Is your research already uh, in use in, in practice? Uh, yeah, so yeah, thanks for the question and also thanks for uh, having me. Um, so what I want to say about the research right, is that many of these approaches I mentioned, they are still in the research side of things, right? We can detect fake news, but there is some limits into how fast we can detect them. Uh, so I would say that maybe it's not in practice in the sense that, okay, let's put an automated system of detecting that, but for sure you can use it the day to uh, help human fact checkers in order to uh, do their job in a better way. So it's not like you're going to uh, replace people or, uh, yeah, uh, that do the fact checking, but you can assist them. I think it's the same with the uh, influencers I mentioned, since there is this um, disclosure or probably not disclosure of us. For that, we're also in contact with the Dutch Consumer uh, Authority, the ACM, just because they also want uh, access to tools that can assist with them this process. So I guess, as I said in the talk, it's very difficult to automate everything, to monitor everything, but you can use technology, let's say, to enhance uh, the human capabilities. But for sure, right, uh, the challenge is that things change a lot. Right. Also, social media changes a lot, like every year. So, whatever you are building now, it might be, let's say, kind of irrelevant uh, tomorrow. I think I mentioned sometime that we used to work a lot on Twitter because on the text page, and now I don't know how many people use TikTok, which is completely video based, and yeah, we still have no access to this data. So, yes and no. In short, to answer your question. Okay. Thank you. Um, I we have. Do you do you want to ask your question, or do we have? No, I the think question we have a question chat from uh, from chat. Yeah, sure, just ask. It. Okay, so we have a, a question from the chat. So please bring on more questions in the in the chat. But uh, Jasper uh, asks uh, if the the people who are spreading fake news or are deliberately uh, doing that know that you, that your method is developed and can they then take. Yeah, can they uh, incorporate it or, or do something about it? Like if the people that say that spreading fake news can, um, you know, take advantage that there is something that detects them? Yes, I think that's the people? idea. Yeah, I think they can deliberately try to hide it from your algorithm, right? If you know what the algorithm is, then they can... I think this is more the yeah, question. Yeah, sure. Um, I think this is one of the findings that every research on fake news has found that it take people uh, that are many bots, right, that are uh, responsible for, let's say, retweeting or reposting news. And of course, that kind of is to detect them. I think research has shown also our research that you can detect very accurately, uh, let's say, um, the people that propagate the fake news, they have less followers than the people that uh, propagate real news. Um, of course, right, any algorithm can be, um, I would say, manipulated, but uh, yeah, at the same time, I would say that the, the challenge they have to face into uh, 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 
challenging for them. Mm -hmm. Rules, techniques improve, people change, but it's kind of a yeah, maybe a mouse race that uh, yeah, as people change their behavior, all sorts of technology will be applied. So I would say yeah, um, if they change, the technology changes as well, and that's kind of easy to do. Yeah, I yes. think that will help Jasper. Yeah. Okay, thank you for your answer. And then we have another question from the chat from Sam. He asks if um, this uh, technology can be uh, implemented without uh, introducing uh, too much uh, censorship on uh, free media. Yeah, uh, this is one of the challenges, right? And we're talking about a technological solution, but it's not really like just technology, right? Technology does not exist in vacuum. It's really embedded in the society. That's why I think I ended the talk by mentioning that whatever we're doing, we need to keep in mind free speech and so on. I think one of the challenging questions here is that who should maybe enforce this kind of, let's bring this new stuff down. Since, of course, people post this, right? But then the social, social media is a platform. Um, would unregulated, especially you know, um, shifting from, let's say, going to newspapers and TV media to social media, which is everybody can post, everybody can repost, and the platform is responsible. That's an ongoing question that I think. Yeah, maybe as technologists or cosmetics are not in place to answer, but it's up for the regulatory authorities and the governments to decide how they should handle it. But that's a very good question. Yeah, I think that's also uh, uh, is in line with the next question of Sam. Is uh, uh, who or why, why sh who should use this technology and, uh, well, should it be, uh, well, who regulated or, or yeah, I think also the like the platforms like fake news, right? Because people keep clicking, so I don't think platforms anytime soon will implement algorithms. So, do you think it's up to them or more the government then? Yeah, so I think uh, that that's a big question going on, right? Maybe in parallel in uh, not just the technological field about the platform regulation and how yeah uh, governments and authorities should intervene. But it's also maybe for specific authorities to um, use these technologies. So as I mentioned, like for the influencers and the disclosure of art, we are in contact with the Dutch Consumer Authority, uh, the ACM, because they are responsible for, let's say, um, yeah, misinformation, let's say, about you know what people are promoting, if it's an ad or not. And, and they really want to use technology, but of course they don't have, the, let's say, the means to build it or even make it possible. So it's even useful for them since they can uh, confirm that there is violation, they can impose fines, and they can do it using this technology. So um, what I want to mention is not just about the news and let's say the platforms in general, but it's maybe broader about, yeah, uh, as I mentioned, we're all consumers on the internet the moment we, I don't know, go on somewhere, especially on social media, and we kind of get protected, and there are different authorities to do that. So the consumer authorities are done. Okay, thank you. And then we have a suggestion from uh, Eric who says, uh, if, uh, wouldn't it be the most effective way to combat the news to the fake news? So, uh, so, so you were explaining that fake news travels faster, but can, can we have a combat between the real news and the fake news? Well, yeah, then, uh, what I say is also based the example of Finland, I mentioned in the talk, that it's also a tough to ask people, right? And we are all on social media, I guess. We are all eager to see something that maybe is becoming viral and uh, retweet it or repost it or send it to our friends. But maybe that's for a, for a moment for us, right? To take a moment, breathe in, and then think about, okay, is it what I'm reading? Is it supposed to be true? Is it something that maybe I should read a bit more about it? Where did it come from? So, uh, you know, technology is not only the solution here, but we need to think also as humans, right? How we can maybe more responsibly at least uh, use social media. Okay, thank you. Um, I don't think we have any more questions from the chat. And um, so I think we have to uh, end this, uh, this,
for this subject now today. Uh, thank you very much, Jerry. And we will return to a break now, and you will see the countdown uh, when we start uh, for the next presentation. Yeah, thank you so much, Jerry.
Well, welcome back. Uh, after this very short break, I hope you had enough time to grab a cup of coffee. In the meantime, we had the switch on the couch. The Hugo left and now uh, Thomas uh, is here in the studio. Uh, welcome, Thomas. Uh, could you uh, explain what your uh, role in the organizing committee was? Yes, so I'm Thomas. I was the officer of promotion. So I made uh, posters. I made uh, uh, the banner, beautiful banner we have right here. And uh, I also um, made the, yeah, the social media page. So if you go to our social media page, it's uh, NWS 2021. Then you can see some uh, pictures we put there behind the screens. So make sure to check it out. And uh, yeah, that's what I did. Okay, well, I think you did a good job because I heard that we have over 100 uh, participants. So that uh, was a result of promotion, uh, I guess. Yes. So, uh, as you already all know, we are a bit uh, behind schedule because we had a false start this morning, but now we are ready to start our uh, second presentation, which is given by uh, Benne de Weger. Benne is an associate professor uh, crypto analysis at the uh, Eindhoven uh, Technical University. He obtained a PhD in Leiden in comp computational number theory. And he has worked at several universities and industries in the field of cryptography. And I think that's also a very uh, uh, important field of uh, research uh, nowadays. And he will uh, take us uh, uh, into the, com the limits on, on comp computational uh, methods. And... Um, and he, he has actually two presentations, and um, so Ben, uh, ben uh, let's uh, hear it. Good evening. Uh, I'm happy that uh, I can speak here. I am uh, grateful to uh, Bakkers for the nice invitation. Uh, what I want to uh, show to you today is uh, two completely different topics in uh, uh, computational number theory under the uh, common denominator of breaking computational limits. Maybe I should have said uh, breaking through computational barriers, but because limits is the, uh, the theme of today, uh, I chose the word limits here. And you will see actually in, in both topics also mathematical limits coming up. So my first part is on fast multiplication. And um, let's immediately go to the contents. Um, so one of the things you uh, want to do as a, a cryptologist, and actually that is my uh, profession now, to, to do a cryptology, uh, you want to be able to compute exactly with very large integers. Of course, computers do those computations, and uh, you probably know that most computers today, modern computers, work with 64-bit memories, and that means that the maximum size of the numbers that they can store have 64 bits, 64 ones and zeros, that, and if you talk about integers, then that means, well, if you talk about unsigned integers, then you can store there the numbers from 0 to 2 to the power 64 minus 1, uh, uniquely. Uh, and for most practical purposes, that is, uh, that is enough, but for cryptologists, it's not. Uh, we work with a lot larger numbers, for example, a crypto system like RSA uses 2,000 or even more than 4,000 bit integers. Uh, and then uh, you, if you want to do arithmetic with it, then you, you have to uh, think about that and design algorithms for it. You already see that with multiplication of 64 bit integers, uh, because if you multiply two numbers that are about of the size of 2 to the power 64, then the product will be 2 to the power 128, and that already does not fit in, in one memory place. You already need two of them. Well, that is still taken care of by the processor, but bigger than that, the processor doesn't do anything, so you have to do that yourself. Um, now, you might say, hey, but then we can use the so-called scientific notation that we round numbers to a certain number of decimal places, and then you simply write an exponent there, like I do here with uh, 2 to the power 2048, which then is 3 point something, and then times 10 to the power 616. And this, of course, is not exact. 
uh, that means that for cryptologic purposes uh, it doesn't work. So we really need to have fully exact arithmetic. Um, the way that is done is just as you are used to in the decimal system, uh, because we have only 10 different digits from 0 to 9, and if you want to express a number of that is larger than 9, than then you need more digits, you simply put them in an array, like here with the number 123. And here you see the, the meaning of that. And it doesn't, you, you, you don't have to use uh, base 10, you can also use base 2 binary numbers or base 16. Uh, and you can use other bases. And well, if you are doing ar arithmetic on a 64-bit computers, then you will use as your digits the uh, the full size of the 64 bits that you have, and that means that then your base is going to be 2 to the power 64, for example. And then if you want to have numbers that are bigger than that, then you simply make arrays of them. And here at the bottom of the slide, I show you then how such uh, an array looks like. Like here you see at the very bottom, you see digits, but each digit has, uh, say, 64 bits. And the number capital B here uh, then is the base of the representation. And uh, that could, for example, be 2 to the power 64. Now, if you are going to design your algorithms, then uh, of course the first thing you start with is addition. And that's very easy. That's, you do that exactly the way as you learned in uh, primary school, because you have this representation in arrays. Uh, and uh, well, I will call the digits from now on words. Uh, then you simply do word-wise addition. So the i-th word of the first number and the i-th word of the second number, you add them together and then you get the i-th word of the answer. Uh, there's only one little change that you have to make, and it could happen that uh, the sum of two digits is going to be too large. It's going to be larger than uh, the base b. Like if you add 9 to 6, that becomes 15, that's larger than, than 9. So it doesn't fit in, in, in one word any longer, well then you do a, a, a simple carry as you uh, learned in primary school. Um, what I'm now interested in is how much work is this? So the complexity of a method like this. Um, well we count that in the number of operations on words because that is what your processor can, uh, can do very quickly. So that's sort of our unit of time, one addition of two words and then uh, you count how many you have to do and then you see that if you have n words for each number, then uh, you simply get something that is linear in n. You have to do for each word one addition and maybe a carry, so uh, it's uh, at most two times n, but actually in I'm not interested in the factor two, only in the function of n that you get there, so I write here the big O of n. Linear complexity for addition and it's also clear that this is optimal, you cannot do it faster than linear because already to write down or to read a number of n words you need time big O of n. Multiplication however is more difficult and here you see a very simple example. So let's do 54 times 21. Here's the primary school method, you first do the 1 times the 54 then you get 54, but actually if you talk about multiplication of single digits then you see that you already have two multiplications here, 1 times 5 and 1 times 4. Then you have to do 2 times 54 gives 108, you again have two single digit multiplications and you see that with uh, numbers that have a word length of 2 you need four multiplications of single words to do one multiplication plus a number of additions. And I'm not interested in the additions here because they are uh, cheap, they are only linear as we saw in the previous slide. So in total you see that the complexity of this method is big O of n square, because each word of the first number has to be multiplied by each word of the second number, so your processor has to do n square multiplications. Um, here is the formula that we just used, uh, and actually I'm not too interested in this formula, but I hope you see here that here you see ai times bj, and you see that for all combinations of i and j, so here you see those n square 
multiplications that you need to do in order to find one big product. Um, now you may say that, uh, hey, there are also multiplications by powers of b here, but they don't count because multiplying with 10 means just putting a number on the right spot or just putting a zero behind. And the same is true in, in general. Multiplication by powers of b is, uh, is free, it doesn't cost anything. So I don't count that. There are other formulas for multiplication, and here is uh, an interesting one. Uh, what I did here is I took this formula, but now I take all equal powers of b together and then see what coefficients you get. And then you get this formula where uh, you see b to the power k and then I gather all possible uh, terms that come with uh, b to the power k and that's all the ai times bj where i plus j is equal to k. This is called the convolution formula. And uh, you could also program that and uh, still you have to, to do all the, uh, the n square uh, single word multiplications if you do it. Um, for future reference I mention here the case n equals 2. So you have only two words here and now I uh, replace the b, the base b, with uh, a variable x. And then you get polynomial multiplication and everything I will say you about uh, number multiplication also is true for polynomial multiplication. It's even easier there uh, simply because you don't have to deal with carries in this case. Uh, so, and I've written down here the, the case n equals 2 and then you see what the formulas look like in a very concrete case. The complexity of multiplication. Well, it's big O of n square, as I said. Actually, this was conjectured by uh, Andrei Kolmogorov, and Andrei Kolmogorov was the father of complexity theory, so uh, 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 a professor at Moscow State University in the 50s, and he uh, sort of uh, started thinking about uh, all those kind of problems. And his conjecture was that uh, if you want to have a general purpose multiplication algorithm, so not special cases, but should be able to do every multiplication, then you cannot do that faster than in n square. And he couldn't prove it, uh, and, uh, but uh, his argument was, uh, well, we have done this for a couple of thousand years already this way, so it probably is the best way of doing it. Then, what he did is he stated this conjecture in 1960 in, uh, in a seminar that he gave at uh, Moscow State University. And in that seminar there was a young student, tw 23 years old, uh, Anatoly Karatsuba. And Karatsuba uh, didn't believe this conjecture and he started thinking about it. And one week later he had found an algorithm that does it faster. And what I want to do now is show you this algorithm by Karatsuba and show you the complexity of it and why that is the case. Actually, it's a very simple idea, and uh, I have always been surprised that uh, uh, in, in many universities, it, in, in uh, mathematics curricula or computer science curricula, it is not taught, because it's such a nice and simple idea, and it really works. It's also efficient. So, here's the result. Karatsuba proved that there is an algorithm, general purpose multiplication algorithm, that has complexity big O n to the power alpha, where the alpha is strictly less than 2, because quadratic complexity means alpha is 2, but the alpha is about 1.58, and to be exact, it is uh, the 2 log of 3. Well, you cannot reach that exactly, but you can come as close as you want. That's why there's an epsilon there. And let me explain Karatsuba's technique. Well, he started with the convolution formula for n equals 2. So basically what he did is he said, uh, well, we have numbers in, uh, in base b with a length of n. Now let us um, split the numbers in half so that you get uh, two halves that are have each length n over 2. And then you apply the convolution formula with x is b to the power n over 2. So I have two different n's here, here is an n equals 2 and here is uh, another n, it's not, not the same n, I'm sorry for that. So the n here is the length of your, the numbers you want to multiply and then you use the convolution formulas for n equals 2. So here's again these convolution formulas, copied from the previous slide. 
And actually, you see the, the C0 here is A0 times B0. So the, the, the Cs are the unknowns that you want to compute, and you know what the A's and the B's are. The C2, the leading coefficient, is A1 times B1. And then the C1 is this typical convolution product where you have two multiplications. Okay, does it help to do it this way? Well, not immediately, because uh, now we are multiplying with uh, numbers of half length. So the numbers AI and BI are half length numbers. And um, that means that if you use the primary school method, then you can multiply them in one half squared of the time of the big number. So uh, each of the half length multiplications is one quarter of the time, but you have to do four of them. See, I have uh, uh, one here, two in the middle, and the fourth one here. So four times one half square is still one, and that means that you haven't saved anything. So it doesn't work immediately, but now comes Karatsuba's real idea. So this is called the divide and conquer method. Well, the divide is clear, you split up your numbers in half, and now we are going to conquer. And Karatsuba noticed that uh, if you have already computed C2, A1 times B1, and C0, A0 times B0, then you can compute C1, this convolution product, you can compute that with only one multiplication. And that's very funny, and it's a funny formula. What you do here is you take the first half of the first number and the second half of the first number, and you add them together. And that's very strange. Why would you do that? You do the same with the second number, you add the first half and the second half together, and then that you multiply, and that's a, a, a big half-length multiplication. But then if you work out this formula, you uh, expand the brackets, then you see you get A1 times B1, that's the C2, we already have it. You get A0 times B0, that's the C0, you already have it. And then you get the A1 times B0 plus the A0 times B1, but that's exactly the convolution product that you need. And so you see you only have to subtract the C2 and the C0 from this single product and you get exactly your number C1. So now we can do it in one, two, three multiplications instead of four. And now we have won some time. Let me give you a short example, 54 times 21 again, uh, I did that before, but now the steps are as follows. You do first 5 times 2 and 4 times 1, that is computing the C2 and the C0, so that gives you a 10 and a 4. Then you do 5 plus 4, that's 9. You do 2 plus 1, that's 3. Then you do 9 times 3, that's again uh, an expensive half length multiplication, so 9 times 3 is 27. We had to subtract the 10 and the 4 from that, so 27 minus 10 minus 4 is 13. And 13 now is the correct value of C1, so now you simply have to uh, uh, add them together, uh, first putting them in the right places, that's multiplying by the powers of, uh, of B, and then adding them together, and you see you get the correct answer, but with only three multiplications instead of four. Now, now you might say this saves you a factor of three quarters, but in the big O it still disappears. N no, it does not disappear in the big O because you can do this recursively. And that's the second nice idea of Karatsuba. Do this recursively. So say you start with uh, 1000 bit numbers N, then you can do one multiplication of 1000 bit numbers as three multiplications of 500 bit numbers. But these 500 bit numbers you still have to do a lot of work. Well, use the same method. So then you get 250 bit numbers and you then need three times three multiplications. And every time you do a recursion step, uh, the size of your number halves and the number of multiplications you have to do uh, triples. So in the end, you will find that you have three to the power K multiplications for uh, after K steps. And then your numbers are of size N divided by two to the power K. Well, when do you stop the recursion when this n divided by 2 to the power k comes in the area of the number 1. So for numbers, bit sizes of about 2 to the power k, or I should say word sizes of 2 to the power k, you can do it in 3 to the power k word multiplications. Well, this number now you can express as n to the power alpha, and then 
if you do the math, then you see that the alpha here is this uh, 2 log of 3. And this uh, shows that the Karatsubas method actually is very simple and works faster than uh, quadratic. Same you can do with uh, polynomial multiplication, I already said that. Um, this was only the start of a whole development of multiplication algorithms. So already a year later, uh, Toom and Cook came up with the idea, can we do this in uh, more than two parts, splitting up in, say, uh, R plus one parts, and uh, then use those convolution formula and see what you can do. And the idea they came up with is with using interpolation. And the idea here is that um, you write down the polynomial formula, and then for the uh, uh, you should remember that the AI are known, and they are now smaller size numbers, so their word length is now n divided by r plus 1, because we have split up our number of length n into r plus 1 parts. The bi also, and the ci, those are the numbers you want to compute. And a fast idea to compute them is just to plug in small values for the variable x, do the multiplications on the left hand side, because then those are uh, smaller multiplications. And then see if you can, uh, uh, can can solve the system for the unknowns, because this is a linear system. The CK are in there linearly, so you can simply use linear algebra on, uh, uh, on what comes out. And uh, this idea works, and we can do the same analysis here as we did with Karatsuba. Namely, one multiplication of length n is now as expensive as 2r plus 1 multiplications, because we have so many... Uh, uh, variables of length n divided by r plus 1, because we divided up our number of length n into r plus 1 parts. And then if you uh, plug in r equal to 1, then here you see uh, three multiplications of length n over 2, and that's exactly what we had with Karatsuba. So it's a similar idea, and if you follow the argument, then uh, you see that in the end you find a method of complexity big O of n to the alpha, where now alpha is given by r plus 1 to the k must be equal to 2r plus 1 to the k alpha, and then you solve that for alpha, and then you find alpha is the r plus 1 base logarithm of the number 2r plus 1. Then you try out a couple of numbers r, and actually here's the first limit. Um, if you now let uh, r go to infinity, then you see that uh, actually this expression for alpha here, uh, log 2r plus 1 divided by log r plus 1, it tends to 1. And that means that you have a whole sequence of multiplication algorithms uh, where the complexity goes to 1, to, to n to the power 1, so it goes to almost linear uh, when r goes to infinity. So multiplication is only slightly more difficult than uh, Adding, and that's a very surprising result. Final remarks for this part. Um, recently, there has been a, a breakthrough. Uh, two years ago, there uh, was a paper by David Harvey and uh, Joris van der Hoeven, and what they do is they give a multiplication algorithm that does it in uh, a big O of n times log n. So that. Uh, was a big breakthrough, it had been conjectured that this might be true, so they, they proved that. And actually you see that what they do here is this plus epsilon that you see here, they now give that a very concrete uh, form of uh, log n. And it's interesting to notice that their algorithm, which is very complicated, uh, but it's also based on this idea of using convolution products. And then, well, if you say a convolution to a mathematician, then he immediately says Fourier transforms. And indeed, uh, Fourier transforms do play a role also in this uh, algorithm. And uh, uh, to end with a very practical remark, uh, the, this algorithm of Harvey and van der Hoeven is not very practical. Uh, you cannot use it, but uh, I mean, it's, so this is a theoretical result. In practice, what we do in, in cryptography is we use Karatsuba uh, or maybe Tom Cook with uh, splitting up into three or four parts, and then already the overhead becomes too uh, too large uh, to use those methods. So uh, th this is basically uh, what uh, uh, what is done in cryptography, also uh, in the 
well, for example, your mobile phone will, will use these methods if, if you want to do cryptographic operations. And fast Fourier techniques, they are used, but only for really extremely large numbers, uh, so big that we don't use them in cryptography. This ends the first part. So we now start with the second part, which is a completely different topic. It's about error-free computation. And um, that is the, the, the limit that we're going to break here is that of error propagation. By uh, using some funny numbers that are called piadic numbers, you probably have never heard of. And there will actually be limits in there. That's, uh, in a sense, the heart, the heart of the matter. So let's start with error propagation. Uh, here's a, a, a nice example. So we have a three by three determinant here of, of integers. And the, uh, well, you can check this, of course, if you like uh, by hand. And that's a little bit of work. But the determinant is equal to one. Then what I do is in one of the numbers, I make a very, very small error. So it's actually in the 10 at the bottom right. I change that into 10.01. So that's uh, an, an error of uh, one tenth of a percent. And if you now do an exact computation of the same determinant, then the answer will be minus 118.94. If you don't believe it, do the calculation yourself and you see that I am not lying here. So this means that a very small error may have very big consequences in a computation. And uh, well, in this case, it is of course due to the fact that if you are uh, doing this determinant computation, then you are computing quite big numbers and then you are subtracting almost equal numbers from each other to get a quite small number because the, the first determinant is a small number, just one. And uh, uh, subtraction is a very uh, a bad problem for, for errors. Um, what is at the heart of, uh, of those things actually is the triangle inequality. So you know the triangle inequality as an inequality for absolute values. So you have the absolute value of x plus or minus y is at most absolute value of x plus the absolute value of y. And that is the root of a lot of, e of th this type of evil. Namely, uh, when I write here a delta, then I mean an error in the argument, so an error in a minus b. And then the error is here written as, uh, well, the, the, the error in a is uh, a minus a bar. So a is the real value, say, and a bar is the approximation of it. So the difference is the error. Well, if you do the computation of a minus b, then uh, if you look at the errors, then you get a minus a bar minus b minus b bar. And then you can apply the triangle inequality, and then you see that you get the sum of the two errors. So you get this error in A plus the error in B. And so that means that errors tend to get bigger. And that's because the triangle inequality actually is uh, a sharp inequality. You cannot avoid this plus here. It, uh, so even if you have a minus here, here it's going to be a plus. So that's a problem and you would like to do something about that. Well, what you would ideally like to have is a better triangle inequality, something like this, x plus or minus y absolute value, if that were be at most the maximum of the absolute values of x and y, then you would not have this fact that errors get bigger, because now an error in x and an error in y, the maximum of that uh, stays of the same size. It's not, not in the worst case, the double of the size. So this would be wonderful. Of course, this is not true. But maybe, somehow, you can make it true. And actually, that's what I'm going to show you, that you can do this. Um, the triangle inequality, uh, of course, is uh, inherently linked to the absolute value function. And if you look at what the nice properties of the absolute value function are, is, of course, that it is uh, bigger than zero unless x is zero. It is multiplicative, so the absolute value of x times y is the absolute value of x times the absolute value of y, and then there's this nasty triangle inequality. And those three properties are sort of defining properties of the absolute value. That's not completely true. I mean, there are other functions than the absolute value that have these properties, but this is everything you use of absolute values. Actually, if you look at the definition of real numbers, and maybe you have uh, uh, seen this before, then uh, uh, if you want to have a nice 
mathematically sound definition, then here is a way to do it. You look at uh, rational numbers and then at sequences of rational numbers that are convergent. And then you can see real numbers as limits of convergent rational sequences. And um, well, in analysis, this is called Cauchy sequences. And then uh, what uh, analysts say is that the, the field R is the completion of the field of the rational numbers with respect to the absolute value. And the absolute value, of course, is in here because you are talking about limits. And inherent in the definition of limit, in this, this epsilon delta definition, there is the absolute value again. Now, it is true that other absolute value functions exist on the rational numbers. Uh, and they lead to other completion fields than the field R. And that's what we are going to exploit now. So now it's going to be a little bit abstract. And if you look at those other absolute values, then there are among them that have indeed better triangle inequalities. And so maybe you can use then uh, those completions to, uh, to do uh, nicer arithmetic with better er error propagation. And let's see how that works. Uh, and indeed you get this triangle inequality that we want with the maximum instead of the sum. And the, the good thing is that the field of rational numbers still is in those fields. So um, that's important because uh, if you are doing computations on a computer, then uh, actually you should realize that what, you, what computers cannot do is work with real numbers. For the simple reason that most real numbers uh, need infinitely many digits and uh, a computer is only a finite machine. So you have to somehow make that a rational number if you want to compute with it. And we, when we are computing with rational numbers anyway, then why not use other completions? So here's the basic idea of what is called the field of piadic numbers. We start with the prime number P. That can be the prime number 2. There is nothing wrong with the prime number 2. Actually, computers use it all the time. Uh, now, for an integer A, we define a function VP. It's called the valuation, piadic valuation, simply as the number of times that the prime P divides this number A. So, for example, for the number 24, I give you as an, as an example, well, 24 is 2 to the power 3 times 3, that means that the 2 addic valuation of 24 is 3. The 3 addic valuation of this number is 1. And for all other primes, the p addic valuation of 24 is 0, because those other primes are not in there. So you get a nice uh, function depending on a prime number p. This valuation has two interesting properties. The first one is what I call a logarithmic property, namely you have the formula that the valuation of a product, A times B, is the sum of the valuations of the two numbers, A and B. So that's sort of uh, similar to, uh, to a logarithmic uh, function. And because you have this property, actually it's very easy to see that you can uh, define this valuation not only on the integers, but also on the rational numbers, simply by using that the valuation of A divided by B then, of course, is the difference of the valuations of A and B. And uh, it takes a minute of thought to realize that actually this is well defined for any rational number. Uh, so you have the valuation actually on Q, not just on the integers. There's a second nice property, and that is that we have an, what I call an additive inequality. So the valuation of A plus or minus B, if you look at that, then you it's easy to see that this is at least the minimum of the valuations of the two numbers A and B themselves. And the reason is very simple. Um, well, we look at how many times P is, can be seen as a factor of A. Well, if P to the V is a factor of A, and if P to the V is also a factor of B, then this P to the V is also a factor of A plus B and A minus B. And this is this gives you immediately this result that the valuation of A plus or minus B is at least the minimum of the valuations of A and B separately. Okay, now I can define the periodic absolute value on rational numbers. And what we simply do is for a number X, rational number X, we define the absolute value of X but with respect to this prime p, so the p-adic absolute value, as p to the power minus this valuation. So let's look at an example. 
the two adic absolute value of the number 24, then you are going to look at how many factors 2 are there in 24. Well, there are 3, so the valuation is 3. Then we take 2 to the power minus 3, this is 1 over 8, and this is now the absolute value, the piadic absolute value of the number 24, if you have chosen the prime 2. And actually, what you see here, that the uh, very basic property of this absolute value is that your numbers now get smaller, within quotes, when they have more factors p in them. So the more factors p a number has, the smaller it is. And this is something that you have to get used to, and it takes a little while, and uh, I now ask of you that you uh, get familiar with that immediately. But I hope uh, it's, it's clear. Um, let's look at properties of this function based on the properties of the valuation. Well, from the logarithmic property of the valuation, you immediately see that this absolute value also has multiplicativity. But much, much more important, this absolute value has this ideal triangle inequality that the uh, absolute value of x plus or minus y is at most the maximum of the absolute values of x and y separately. And that follows immediately from, uh, uh, from this property I had on the previous slide, the uh, inequality I had there. So here we now have an absolute value function that uh, satisfies everything we want. And so what we would like to do is uh, see what we get as, uh, as limits if you take this as absolute value, because as soon as you have an absolute value, then you can talk about the concept of convergent sequences and of limits. Now, uh, just for completeness, uh, there is a, a well-known theorem by Ostrovsky that more or less says that the only non-trivial absolute values on the rational numbers are the real one and all the piadic ones. So actually, uh, actually uh, other absolute values do not exist, essentially. I am lying a little bit here, but only a very little bit. So, uh, here are the limits. An absolute value leads to concepts of limits and convergence. And uh, as soon as you see that that is the case, then uh, you can talk about Cauchy sequences of rational numbers. So, we simply start with the good old rational numbers. You make a sequence a1, a2, a3, etc. in that. And now you make that sequence converge in the piadic sense. And here is a uh, formal definition of uh, what that means. Then you can define an equivalence relation on those Cauchy sequences where you say, well, basically what this says is that uh, two of those sequence you sequences, you say that they are equal, or they, they are equivalent if and only if, and basically what this says is that their difference has as limit zero, and then you say those two convergent sequences have the same limit. And then, um, a formal definition of the field of periodic numbers is then exactly how you would uh, define real numbers as equivalence classes of Cauchy sequences. And then you have to think about uh, uh, how to get ar arithmetic operations on those objects, but actually that's all not too difficult. So in this way you get different fields, different completions of the rational numbers, and those are called the QP, the fields of piadic numbers. Now, this is all abstract nonsense and we want to do something concrete here, because we want to do arithmetic. So for example in the field of two adic numbers, well, there are rational numbers in there, so 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, they are just rational numbers. They are also two adic numbers, but you see that the number of factors 2 now grows and grows and grows, and that means that those numbers in the two adic sense get smaller and smaller and smaller, and this converges to zero. So here we have a sequence that converges to zero. Then what I do in the second example is I just take those numbers and I subtract one from each of them, you get 1, 3, 7, 15, 31, 63. That is also a convergent sequence and it converges to, well, what I did is I subtracted minus one everywhere, so this must converge to minus one. In a toetic sense, this is true. It's, it sounds crazy, but it's serious mathematics. And here is a nice application of this. Uh, 
If you add the powers of 2, 1 plus 2 plus 4 plus 8 plus 16, etc., well, if you do that in the real numbers, then of course the answer is infinite. But here, if you look at the partial sums, then you get exactly those numbers I had up here, 1, 3, 7, 15, 31, etc. So this must converge to minus 1 in the two addicts. And actually, this is uh, compatible with the well-known formula for the geometric series, the sum of r to the power i is 1 divided by 1 minus the multiplication factor r. And if you plug in r equals 2, then you see that uh, the answer must be minus 1. It can't be anything different. Well, you, you can uh, now f uh, try to find all kinds of funny numbers, like the square root of minus 1 actually is in the 5 addic numbers, but the square root of 2 is not in the 5 addic numbers, and this just shows that it really is a completely different idea than real numbers. And uh, I've written out here a sequence 2 plus 1 times 5 plus 2 times 5 square, and then you see that actually you get increasing powers of 5, but with only small digits in front of them. So this is a convergent series, and actually this is the start of the uh, uh, series that uh, converges to the square root of minus 1. You have to do some work to prove this. So you just already saw that you can represent periodic numbers again as a, a series, just like you can uh, represent real numbers as a series with uh, decreasing powers of 10. You can get piadic numbers as a series, but now with increasing powers of p. Because in the real world, decreasing powers of 10 go to zero, and in the piadic world, increasing powers of p go to zero. So you get here expansions like this. A number x is uh, well coefficients x v, x v plus 1, etc., times powers p to the v, p to the v plus 1, p to the v plus 2, etc. And those x's, those uh, coefficients here, you now can take them to be piadic digits, and those are just the numbers 0, 1, up to p minus 1. So that's how you can represent piadic numbers. And here again is an example. Uh, for example, the rational number 1 third in the two addicts looks like this. 1 plus 2 plus 2 to the 3 plus 2 to the 5, and then all odd powers of 2. And this is not too hard to prove. And here is what people then often use as the notation for this, where you just write down the coefficients in front of the powers of 2, so you get 1s and zeros uh, uh, alternating, alternating, except uh, in the beginning it's slightly different. And then there's a, a piadic point, so it's not a decimal point, it's a piadic point here at the start. But I won't use this notation further. Um, we're talking about doing computations, so that usually uh, is uh, with finite numbers, so you can sort of truncate a piadic expansion uh, exactly the same as you can, can truncate an uh, expansion of a real number, and then you get, again, rational numbers. And then, uh, well, if you do this, for example, with a number alpha, and you truncate at a just before the rth power of p there, then you get a number alpha rr, and that is uh, then an integer, and that's actually the unique integer in 0, 1, up to p to the r minus 1, such that alpha r is congruent to alpha modulo p to the r. And as soon as you realize this, that this is what you are doing, you are computing modulo very high powers of p, then you know how you can compute. So piadic Arithmetic is just integer arithmetic, but then modulo increasing powers of p. And, of course, somewhere you stop with this uh, increasing the power of p. But in theory, you go on with to infinitely high powers of p. And the good thing is that because of this ideal triangle inequality, error propagation does not occur anymore. As soon as you have fixed r, fixed the... Uh, the place where you truncate, so that's, that's the precision of your number, then your arithmetic is just modulo p to the r, and that's error-free, because uh, the error now is a piadic error, and that simply measures how many uh, times p is in there, and now if you add two numbers, then uh, uh, that does not increase, so the error bound p to the minus r that you have uh, stays the same. And this 
means that you now can do error-free computation. There is one exception, and that is as soon as you divide by the prime number p, then you lose a little bit of precision. So you should take care that you uh, avoid that as much as possible. Okay, then we get uh, our computation model for doing computations with real numbers without errors. Here's the computation model if you want to compute some function, y equals f of x for a real number. And you have an algorithm for this function x that uses many steps, uh, additions, subtractions, multiplications, divisions. What can you do? Well, first thing you do is you take your number x, you convert it to a rational number. That's nothing new. You do that anyway if you have to feed it into a computer because computers only understand rational numbers. So you already start working with an approximation of x, which is a rational number. And now the difference is that you now do not want the uh, denominator b to be a high power of 2 or something, but you just want a and b to be as small as possible. Then you choose a prime p and a precision r in which you are going to work, and from now on your computations are going to be done modulo p to the r. You convert your rational number to a periodic approximation of it. That means you find this periodic representation uh, as a finite uh, series in powers of p. So that's a conversion you have to do. Then you make your function f, you make uh, that into a periodic function. Uh, usually that, uh, in mathematical sense, that means nothing special, but uh, if you are uh, have, having doing it in a computer, then you have to write special software for that. But that's straightforward. And then you compute this function fp of your uh, periodic number xi r, and this computation, as we saw, is the one that's error-free. So this is the point where you are going to win. Then you have your result that I call here eta r. You have to now convert that back to a number in q. So the eta r, you know it modulo p to the r as this expression with powers of p. You have to find again the fraction that I now call c over d as a rational number. And then hopefully that's the, uh, uh, close to the real number. And that's the last step. You have to convert back this c over d to, uh, to a real number. And this last step actually is the easy one, that's just doing a long division. So this is the computation model, model, and you see the heart of the matter is here where you are applying the function f, there you are going to reach error freeness, hopefully. Uh, some things to take care of, one is that you should take p and r big enough so that uh, you keep enough information so that you do not lose precision. You have that problem anyway. You should be alert for dividing by p, because that will uh, introduce some errors. So the error propagation here is not absolute. It's also not absolute in the sense that uh, only errors inside the computation of f, you can do something about it. But uh, what is outside the computation of f, uh, so, for example, the error that you make in converting the input of f, the output of f, that's something you don't, still don't have under control. So if your f really is ill-conditioned, that you may be able to code, but others not. Um, and then maybe you ask, why haven't I seen this method before? Well, it's not very popular, and that is because its actual use is tricky. Um, so uh, it only works if the answers of your results are sort of nice enough. And uh, one problem is that if they are just not nice enough, then uh, maybe you get an answer that is correct in the periodic sense, but that way may, may be totally wrong in the real sense. Let me, to end this talk, give you one example. Uh, Oh, well, uh, let me first tell you a little bit about those conversions you have to do, but I'm doing this uh, quite quickly. Uh, so the first conversion you have to do is from real to rational. Actually, that is what uh, number theorists call a continued fraction algorithm, but th that's just a variant of Euclid's algorithm. And basically, um, what comes out of such a continued fraction is that uh, for a, a real number x that you have with a certain precision, say of epsilon, then you can get uh, 
a rational number A divided by B, which where the A and the B are both approximately epsilon to the power minus one half. And here I give an example. Here I have uh, like the first 12 uh, digits of the number E. So this has an error of about 10 to the power minus 12. That means that you can expect a, a, a rational number with numerator and denominator of about six digits. Six is half of 12. That has an error that's not bigger, not essentially bigger than this 10 to the power minus 12. So then you get an idea of how you can uh, translate precision in real numbers to how big your fraction is going to be. Then we have to turn rational numbers into p-adic numbers, but basically that's just computing modulo p to the r, and you know that uh, dividing modulo p to the r is just Euclid's algorithm. And finally, at the end, you have to turn back your p-adic number into a rational number. Uh, actually, this was the subject of my uh, master thesis a long time ago. And you could say that this is a p-adic continued fraction, but again, you can say this is a variant of Euclid's algorithm. Let me give an example of this. So suppose you want to compute 19 times 3 fifths minus 4 seventh. If you do this exactly, then the answer is 19 35th. If you do this in real arithmetic with three digit precision, well, then the 3 fifth will turn into 0 0.600, the 4 seventh will turn into 0 0.571. You see, I have chosen on purpose two numbers that are not that far apart, so that if you subtract them, you lose precision. You basically have only two digits precision left here, 0 0.029. That you multiply by 19, you get 0 0.551, and the real answer is 0 0.543. So you see the error propagation at work here. Now let's see if we do the same computation too adequately. And I choose the same type of precision, so I had real precision three digits, so that's about 10 to the minus 3. Well, 10 to the minus 3 is about 10 to the, uh, 2 to the minus 10, so 1000 is about 1024. So let me take as prime 2 here and as the uh, parameter r, the power to which we are going to raise to, uh, 10. Then that gives us the piadic precision. Well, then 3 fifth is 615. Uh, I could have written here the, the bits the ones and the zeros, but I chose just to, uh, oops, sorry for that. I chose just to uh, use the decimal uh, representation here because you are familiar with that. So 3 fifths is 615 modulo 2 to the power 10, 4 seventh is 732 modulo 2 to the power 10. We subtract them, then you get 907, so 615 minus 732 is 907 modulo 1024. That times 19 gives us 849. And now I want to convert this 849 back to a fraction. Okay, here we go. We have the number 849. I want a fraction c over d that is the same as 849 modulo 2 to the power 10. And I want c and d to be as small as possible. Well, this means that for some number k, you have that 849 times d, so I multiply out the d here, 849 times d, equals c, but then plus k times 2 to the 10. That's what the modulo means. And if you look at this equation, and then you say, uh, now I want to express c and d, say in a vector, but you can just as well read this as a fraction, then you see that you get 849 1 times d minus 2 to the 10 0 times k and you get a linear combination of two vectors here and that's very useful you can write that as a matrix computation and then uh, actually uh, this is behind the, the the lattice structure and then what you're going to do is apply what i call lattice basis reduction but what actually is just euclid's algorithm you subtract the smaller column from the larger column and you repeat this until uh, you can't reach any improvement anymore. And in this case, it's only four simple steps from the first one. If you subtract 849.1 once from 1024.0, then you get 175 minus 1, and then you switch roles, then you're going to subtract 175 minus 1 number of times from 849.1 until you get the smallest numbers, and you continue like that. And then in the end, you see the 1935 popping up. And this is a column, so this is such a 
such a CD vector, because you are just taking combinations of columns here. And then you see that actually this is uh, completely error-free, the correct answer that you find from this. And you don't have any problems anymore with the error propagation because you are subtracting two numbers that are almost equal. And this is what I wanted to show you. Thank you. Well, thank you, Benna. I think it was a very clear presentation, but we did have some uh, minor technology problems in the beginning of the presentation. There were some hiccups in, in, the, uh, in the streaming. Uh, I well the the sound was okay but uh, the image was a bit on the delay I I hope it didn't uh, interrupt too much and that everybody could still understand uh, the the things you were presenting but maybe that will lead uh, to uh, more questions so we will check the questions in the chat and I see the first question from David he asks on slide 26, there's a question of what function you are trying to calculate or does it depend on the input? So I think maybe you can uh, return to slide 26. Yes, thank you for the question. I will try to share my screen now. Um, Oh, sorry, I uh, have to do it like this. Um, I hope now you see slide 26. Yes. Yes, yes, that's clear. Okay, great. So uh, um, the question is on... Uh, let me see. Uh, so uh, things can go wrong, and what does that depend on? Well, it, it, it indeed can depend on, on, on the function that you are trying to compute, because uh, well, this function can be uh, somewhat ill-conditioned, and that, that, that may uh, mean that uh, uh, this method of piadic computation does not help you uh, very much. Uh, if your function is well-conditioned, uh, then there, uh, in principle, there should not be a problem, uh, but it can also depend on, on the input. Uh, uh, so you, you, you want to sort of estimate upfront if uh, the answer that you, you get uh, is going to be converted correctly in, in the last step. And that's, that's something that is, is sort of hard to, to predict. And, uh, whether that's going to happen can indeed depend on the function, and uh, but it can also depend on the input. So uh, I haven't seen a lot of literature that, that tries to tackle this problem. So uh, that, that means that probably it's, it's, uh, it's quite hard to do uh, in general. So uh, basically what you do in practice is you just try it out. Ben, can you talk a bit louder? We have a... Totally, totally off. There's a, uh, if you have an answer that's totally off, then uh, 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 you have to, to reject it and try some other method. Okay, there was one question, if you talk, can talk a bit, um, <laughs> not on the subject, if you can talk closer to the microphone, because it sound is uh, sometimes a bit uh, weak, but... Well, uh, okay, uh, is, I, is this better? Yes, I yes. think so, yes. Okay, thank you for the answer. I hope it answers. Uh, David has a, a second uh, question also. Uh, uh, is how to determine whether your answer will be uh, nice. Uh, how do you determine that? Uh, that's something that you uh, have to uh, develop a sort of a feeling for, from uh, knowing a little bit about the function. So usually you have an idea that uh, the answer that you get uh, will uh, be in a certain interval, say. And if you have the proper precision, then that means that from that you can know uh, how to uh, choose the, the p to the power r. That, ha that has to be big enough. And then you can ensure that doing everything with all the computations with fractions uh, will 
give you a, a fraction that has uh, at the size of the numerator and the denominator about half the precision that you have, and then you know that you are in, in the, the correct area. So it's, it's not uh, rocket science, it, it's really uh, often a matter of, of trial and error to, to see if you get the, the, the right uh, precision. And well, of course, that also explains uh, why this method uh, has never become very popular. Okay, thank Does you. That answer the question? Yes, yes, yes I, I think, think so. so. Uh, Thomas, uh, you have another question? Yes, you had a nice uh, triangle inequality you were talking about that is not uh, directly one we know. So do you also use this in other uh, problems? Do you also have this triangle inequality in uh, other cases? Do you know anything about this? Um, well, in a more general sense, uh, applications of, of periodic numbers, maybe that is then uh, the question. Mm -hmm. uh, because... Uh, uh, well, um, originally uh, my topic was solving Diophantine equations, so that has nothing to do with cartography. Um, uh, there it turned out to be very useful to, uh, uh, to use periodic numbers, and that's where my interest came from. Um, I do know that uh, uh, these periodic numbers... Uh, even show up in uh, in physics. I mean, there's uh, something called periodic string theory, and don't ask me anything about it because I don't know what it is. But periodic numbers uh, are useful also for for physicists, and uh, that's very surprising to me. But it turns out to be the case. So yes, there are other applications than in in number theory. But there are also applications in, in cartography that I, I cannot talk about, but, but uh, where it, it helps you to use periodic numbers to, to, to uh, see if some systems are strong enough. Yes, okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. It's uh, good to hear something about the uh, application. Um, I see we have another question. I think it's also from the previous uh, one in the chat. Uh, about the last example, I think it was, uh, and uh, the question is, how do you know that the right answer would not be 849? Because that's the same representation. Uh, I cannot read the question uh, exactly here. Modulo uh, <laughs> something and then the last thing is hard to read. So, uh, yeah, uh, modulo 2 to the power 10. Yes. Uh, so th that's again this this problem uh, that you uh, try to to make your precision such that, that that you know that the numerator and denominator of of the rational number that you get uh, are below some threshold, and here that threshold is is about this this number thirty five or forty. So as answer, you got nineteen divided by thirty five, and that's the only fraction in that. Uh, uh, with that size numerator and denominator that you uh, you get as an answer, so then the guess is th that that should be the real answer. And so uh, it's really balancing this this precision of the numerator and denominator, or the, or the size of the numerator and denom denominator, with the precision of the numbers you are working with. And 849 is. It, of course, also a rational number, it's 849 divided by 1, but it has a way too large uh, numerator uh, to, to be able to uh, be a reasonable answer. So, periodically, it's a correct answer. In the real sense, the correct answer is the one with the smallest possible numerator and denominator. I hope this answers the question. Yes, I think so. And I see that this also was the last question. So uh, Ben, uh, thank you very much for uh, your presentation. Um, uh, after this presentation, now we have a small break uh, until for the, then we have the, the third presentation and after that lunch. And now time for a short break and then we'll see you right back. Thank you.
Well, welcome back everybody uh, for this uh, third uh, presentation uh, this morning. Uh, the next presentation will be by uh, Jasper de Jong. And Jasper is actually here in the studio. So uh, he, he works at the uh, University of Twente, so he works here. So for him it was not a, a long distance travel to, to get here. No traffic jams on the way to, uh, to here. And uh, well, Jasper, uh, well, I'm, I'm not going to introduce your uh, your your uh, presentation now because you will do that much better than I do. As you know, I work for Rijkswaterstaat, and we are very interested in traffic jams and uh, time traveling and and uh, rekening rijden. Well, I, I heard you are going to, to to talk about this, so maybe you can give a short introduction and then we will start the presentation uh, yes well actually the short introduction is already in the video so, so I, I think it's best to just watch uh, afterwards uh, I'm interested in all the questions okay Everyone well will. let's bring it on <laughs> welcome my name is Jasper de Jong and I am a teacher at the University of Twente that's all you get to know about me for now because I have something a lot more interesting to talk about, road pricing. The Dutch government is planning to implement some form of road pricing in 2026. Road pricing means that road users are charged fees based on the roads they use during traveling. This could be as simple as charging each user for the amount of kilometers they drive. But it can go as far as charging prices based on specific roads and specific times. The VVD, the largest political party in the Netherlands, has tried to prevent this for a long time. And even now, they are considering only using road pricing for electric cars. Arjen Lubach, the Dutch John Oliver, even did a segment on the benefits of road pricing in his weekly so show Zondag met Lubach. He criticized our Prime Minister, Mark Rutte's argumentation against it with a lot of humor. So, if you haven't seen it yet, be sure to check it out. So, should we implement road pricing? My own PhD research is related to this topic, so I have quite a strong personal opinion. Obviously yes. Please note that this is my opinion. I'm not going to mathematically prove this, as there are many practical issues that I'm not familiar with. However, I will show you my research. And I'm quite certain that at the end of this talk, you will be convinced as, as well. If you don't think so, that's even more reason to pay close attention. At the end, you can ask me your critical questions. I will start with our Prime Minister's argument against it. Well, argument? It's more like name-calling. He calls it automobilistje pesten, which translates to driver bullying. This is quite deceptive, as it implies that there is some sort of trade-off. On the one hand, we can improve the environment using road pricing to reduce carbon emissions. On the other hand, we would bully people into traveling less, making them less productive and hurting the economy. Well, this trade-off simply doesn't exist. When done right, road pricing can lead to reducing emissions as well as increasing productivity. The main reason is that we can use road pricing to reduce travel times. When travel times are reduced, people have more time left for work, so they become more productive. Note that reducing travel times doesn't necessarily imply that carbon emissions are reduced. However, it seems reasonable that it does. And, as we will see, minimizing travel times as opposed to emissions is very convenient for our model. So, improving the economy as well as the environment, that almost sounds too good to be true. You must be really curious about this model now, so let me introduce it with the following example. It is an example of a network congestion game called Brace Paradox. We have a set of N drivers, which we call players, as is common in game theory. In our example, we have 100 players. 
Each player I has a source node, SI, and a target node, TI. In this specific example, all players have the same source and destination, so we'll simply call them S and T. There are also intermediate nodes connected by arcs. Each arc represents a road segment. And each road segment E has a latency function LE of X, which denotes the travel time as a function of X, the number of players using it. In this example, Two road segments have a constant latency function of 100 minutes. Also, two road segments have a variable latency function x in minutes equal to the number of players using them. This function indicates that these roads are smaller and traffic jams are more likely to occur here. Finally, we have a road segment that takes zero minutes. That does not sound very realistic. But keep in mind that this graph is simply a model. In practice, these nodes could be very close to each other. Now, each player chooses a strategy, which is simply a path from S to T. As a society, our aim is to minimize the total travel time, the sum of travel times of all players. It is not hard to see that this occurs when 50 players choose the top route and 50 players choose the bottom route. Then, the variable road segments both have a travel time of 50 minutes. So each player has a travel time of 50 plus 100 equals 150 minutes. This makes the total travel time 100 times 150 equals uh, 15,000 minutes. We denote this by C of opt which stands for the cost in the social optimum. However, we live in a free country, so each player is allowed to choose his own strategy. Consider a player on the top route. He can switch to this route. Now, the bottom right road segment has a travel time of 51 minutes, so his travel time is now 50 plus 0 plus 51 equals 101 minutes. That is a decrease of 49 minutes. But he is not the only one who can improve. In fact, all players choosing the top route are at least as well off when they choose the zigzag route instead. Moreover, all players choosing the bottom route are also at least as well off when they choose the zigzag route instead. So, because of their individual freedom, everyone will take the zigzag route. Both of these road segments now have a travel time of 100, so each player has a travel time of 100 plus 0 plus 100 equals 200 minutes. In this situation, no player can improve their own travel time by deviating from their own strategy. In game theory, this is called a Nash equilibrium, named after Nobel Prize winner John Nash. This person is not John Nash, but Russell Crowe, who played Nash in the movie A Beautiful Mind. If you haven't seen it yet, I recommend watching it. Even though it uses an example of a Nash equilibrium that is not actually a Nash equilibrium, the movie is quite interesting. But let's get back to our example and compute how much time our players have saved. Let's see. They have saved 150 minus 200 equals negative 50 minutes each. Hmm, what's going on? Well, it's not called a paradox for nothing. The reason that travel times increase is that while decreasing their personal travel time, each player increases the other player's travel times. For example, look at the last player to switch from the bottom route to the zigzag route. This player doesn't even improve his own travel time. It is 200 minutes either way. But by taking the zigzag route, all other 99 players on the bottom right road segment have an increase by one minute. So, while freedom sounds nice, it is also the freedom to harm others. In game theory, we have a concept to quantify this harm. 
the price of energy, abbreviated by POA. It is defined as the total cost to society in a worst Nash equilibrium divided by the total cost to society in a social optimum. What do I mean by worst Nash equilibrium? Well, you may have noticed that this is not the only Nash equilibrium in the example. When one player takes the top route and all other players take the zigzag route, also no player can improve. So this is also a Nash equilibrium. However, it is not the worst one as the total travel time here is slightly lower. Ok, so what is the price of energy for this example? Well, as we computed, it is 20,000 over 15,000 equals 4 over 3. This means that our freedom increases the total travel time by a factor of 4 over 3. I feel that you might already be quite critical of this. Please note that I'm not arguing against our freedom. We could achieve the social optimum with what is known as a benevolent dictator. A dictator who has society's best interest at heart. Of course, this system has an obvious flaw. We know from experience that things uh, can become quite bad when dictators are not benevolent. Instead, I'm arguing that we should aim for the social optimum in a way that only slightly decreases our freedom. For example, road pricing. If we put a toll on the middle road segment, then we can disincentivize many players from using it. This will result in a smaller total travel time. You might wonder, why don't we simply remove this road segment? Well, in this particular example, that would probably be the best option. That is why it is a paradox. However, there are also examples where we do need road pricing. In fact, if you're interested, research has been published on how to actually choose road prices for certain models. Ok, so surely if our Prime Minister knew about this new revolutionary theory, he would be in favour of road pricing, right? Well. Here's where I would have loved to make the joke that Brace came up with this example before our Prime Minister was born. Unfortunately for the joke, Brace was just one year too late. Our Prime Minister was one year old when Dietrich Brace published his paradox. Nevertheless, I feel that Mark Rutte has had enough time to get familiar with the literature. Ok, a factor of 4 over 3 sounds bad. But if this is the absolute worst case, then things might be fine in practice. So you might be wondering if 4 over 3 is the worst possible price of anarchy. Or do there exist road networks with an even higher price of anarchy? Well, you're not the only one wondering this. There is even a game theoretical concept that describes this. Confusingly, it is also called the price of anarchy. The price of anarchy of a class of games S is defined as the supremum of the price of anarchy of all the games I from that class. In 2005, Christodoulou and Kutsupias proved that for the class where all latency functions are affine with non-negative coefficients, the price of anarchy is 2 for 2 players and 2.5 for 3 or more players. Here is the worst case example for two players. All arcs have a latency function x, where x is the number of players on that arc. It is optimal when both players go directly to their target node. This yields a social optimum of 1 plus 1 equals 2. However, when the players take these routes instead, it is also a Nash equilibrium. Let's check if this is actually a Nash equilibrium. Player 1 has a travel time of 1 plus 1 equals 2. Suppose that he deviates and decides to go directly. In this case, he uses the same road segment as player 2, therefore his travel time is also 2. By symmetry, you can see that the same holds for player 2. Since no player can decrease their 
own travel time by deviating, this is indeed a Nash equilibrium. In this Nash equilibrium, the total travel time is 2 plus 2 equals 4, so the price of anarchy of this particular example is indeed 2. However, Kutsupia's paper is not just about this example, it makes the claim that the price of anarchy for the entire class of affine two-player network congestion games is 2. So what was then the purpose of this example? Well, it provides a lower bound on the price of anarchy of this class. To prove that the price of anarchy of this class equals 2, we need to find a matching upper bound proof. A proof. Those could get complicated, but this one really isn't. I would say it's even easier than the lower bound example. Here we go. Suppose uh, player 1 switches from his Nash equilibrium strategy to the strategy he chooses in the social optimum. The notation on the right hand side means that player 2 still chooses his Nash equilibrium strategy. This inequality holds by the Nash equilibrium property. The costs have to increase since player 1 cannot improve. By doing this, player's 1 travel time becomes at most twice the travel time in the social optimum. This follows from the latency functions being fine with non-negative coefficients. On each arc, the largest relative increase occurs when the other player does not use it in the optimum and does use it in the Nash equilibrium. This will increase by, uh, it by a factor of at most 2. By the same argument, we derive the same result for player 2. Now, summing over both players, we obtain that the Nash equilibrium costs are at most twice the optimal costs. Therefore, the price of anarchy is at most 2. Together with the lower bound example, this proves the theorem. For three or more players, the price of anarchy is slightly higher, 2.5. The upper bound proof is quite a bit more challenging, so I'm not going to show it here. I will show you the lower bound example though. We have three players. Every player has two options of traveling through this network. They can either go in a straight line, or they can take this route. The only arcs that contribute to the travel time are the fat arcs. They all have latency function x, where x is the number of players using that arc. All other arcs have a latency function that is always zero. The social optimum is when each player travels in a straight line. This way, each player passes the minimum number of fat arcs, 2. Since there is no overlap, each player has a travel time of 1 plus 1 equals 2 for a total travel time of 6. When each player chooses this route, we have a Nash equilibrium. To see why, we again check the travel time per player. Each player shares the first two fat arcs with one other player and is the only user on their third fat arc. Therefore, each of them has a travel time of 2 plus 2 plus 1 equals 5. Suppose that player 1 deviates to a straight line. Then he would share his first arc with two other players and his second arc with one other player. Therefore, this also results in a travel time of 3 plus 2 equals 5. By symmetry, the other players also have no incentive to deviate. So this is indeed a Nash equilibrium. The total travel time is 3 times 5 equals 15, so the price of anarchy for this example is 15 over 6 equals 2.5. If you are interested in the upper bound proof, as well as bounds for different types of latency functions, you can check out Kutsupia's paper. However, we have more interesting things to talk about. Remember when I told you to be critical? 
I hope you are critical about these examples. When I first saw them, I was definitely critical. Why would players choose these strange routes? Sure, technically this is a Nash equilibrium, but a Nash equilibrium is supposed to model rational behavior. It doesn't seem very rational for the drivers to behave like this. So what would be rational behavior? Well, I personally have played many board games in my life, therefore I tend to think of these games sequentially. The definition of a sequential game is quite tedious, so let me explain this concept using the two-player example from before. Instead of focusing on a Nash equilibrium outcome without any regard for how the players got themselves into this mess, we let the players choose their actions sequentially. First, player 1 decides whether to go directly or take the other route. Suppose player 1 goes directly. Next, observing the choice of player 1, player 2 gets to pick a route. He could go directly, which results in a travel time of 1 for both players, or he could take the other route, resulting in time 1 for player 1 and 2 for player 2 himself. Rationally, he would prefer a travel time of 1. Alternatively, player 1 could choose the other route. Again, this results in two options for player 2. Both options would yield a travel time of 2, so both would be rational for him. So, what is rational for player 1? Well, player 1 can anticipate the choice of player 2. Assuming rational behavior of player 2, we observe the following in the game tree. The left option yields player 1 a travel time of 1, while the right option yields him a travel time of 2. He clearly prefers the left option, the direct route. This equilibrium concept is called a subgame perfect equilibrium. The subgame perfect equilibrium is a complete description of each player's rational actions in each subtree. The subgame perfect outcome is a set of actions that occurs when each player actually behaves like this. So for this example, the subgame perfect outcome is when both players choose the direct route. Analogous to the price of anarchy, the sequential price of anarchy is the ratio of the worst case subgame perfect equilibrium and the social optimum. For this example, they are the same, so the sequential price of anarchy equals 2 over 2 equals 1. To me, this new equilibrium concept felt a lot more natural than the classic Nash equilibrium. Note that representing a game as a tree was not a new concept. Classic board games have been represented in extensive form by Kuhn since 1953. Also, the subgame perfect equilibrium is not a new concept. It was introduced by Selton in 1965. The new idea is looking at a game that is not sequential and turning it into a sequential game to analyze its subgame perfect equilibrium. I would have loved to be able to tell you that I was the one who first came up with this revolutionary new concept. Unfortunately, just like Brace, I was one year late. Instead, Tardos and others published an article on the sequential price of anarchy in 2012. They studied the sequential price of anarchy for four different classes of games and found that often it was considerably smaller than the price of anarchy. In the example you just saw, the sequential price of anarchy was also considerably lower than the price of anarchy. However, this was just an example. I wanted to find the sequential price of anarchy for the entire class of affine congestion games. Before I can finally show you the results of my research, I first have to clarify one final detail. I looked into congestion games. Note the lack of the word network. Congestion games are a generalization of network congestion games. 
you can think of them as network congestion games without the network structure. For our last example, the corresponding congestion game is as follows. All the arcs are modeled as abstract resources. Player 1 can choose either this resource or these two resources. Player 2 can also decide between two possible actions. In this example, each resource has a cost equal to the number of players choosing it. This cost corresponds to the travel time. I hope that it is clear that this game has the exact same properties as the corresponding network congestion game. In fact, we can model any network congestion game as a congestion game. However, the converse is not true. Some sets of actions cannot be modeled using a network structure. Alright, we have introduced all the concepts, so it is finally time for the results of my research. First of all, the sequential price of anarchy for affine two-player congestion games is 1.5. The lower bound example is as follows. Player 1 can choose between two resources. Both of them have a cost of x, where x is the number of players choosing it. Player 2 can choose the second of these resources, but also a different resource with cost 2. The social optimum is when player 1 chooses the first resource, leaving the other one for player 2. Then, both players have a cost of 1, so the total cost is 2. The worst case subgame perfect equilibrium is as follows. Player 1 chooses the second resource, anticipating that player 2 will choose the resource with cost 2. This results in a total cost of 1 plus 2 equals 3. When you think about this example in practice, this can be confusing. You might be wondering why player 1 would risk choosing the second resource. He does not gain anything by doing this, but he risks player 2 also choosing this resource. This would double the cost of player 1. Well, the answer is that when you look at the definition, this is technically a subgame perfect equilibrium. Given these strategies, no player can improve in any subgame. However, if you're not satisfied by this answer, you can also think about this slightly adjusted example. We have decreased the cost of the resources by multiples of some small number epsilon. Now, player 1 has an actual reason for choosing the second resource, as it is now strictly cheaper. Moreover, he also has an actual reason to believe that player 2 won't choose the same resource, as now his other resource is also strictly cheaper. By choosing epsilon arbitrarily small, this will not have any impact on the sequential price of anarchy. Also note that I'm finally complying with the theme of this symposium. Alright, that was the lower bound example. So how can we find a matching upper bound? Why can't the sequential price of energy for two players be greater than 1.5? Well, this proof is trickier than Kutsupia's proof for the price of energy, but the structure is very similar. Again, we start with the total cost in the subgame perfect outcome and we try to upper bound it in terms of the total cost in the social optimum. However, we can't use the same argument. We would like to argue that for player 1, the cost in the subgame perfect outcome is at most the cost if he were to switch to the action he picks in the social optimum. For a Nash equilibrium in a non-sequential game, this holds by definition. However, for a sequential game, this is not necessarily true. It might happen that, if player 1 deviates to his social optimum strategy, then player 2 would choose a different strategy that increases the cost of player 1. However, we can make this argument for player 2, since at that point player 1 has already chosen his strategy. Using these types of properties, we can set up a chain of inequalities that eventually leads to 1.5 times the cost in the social optimum. Therefore, the sequential price of energy is indeed 1.5. If you are interested in the details, 
you can check out my PhD thesis. All right, so for this class of games, the price of energy is 2, while the sequential price of energy is 1.5. That is in line with the results of Tardos, who also found lower sequential price of energies. Now for the three-player case. Recall that the price of energy is 2.5. Any guesses what the sequential price of energy might be? My initial guess was 2, but I was very wrong. It turns out that the sequential price of energy for affine three-player congestion games is, drumroll, 1039 over 488. That sounds crazy, right? Well, I guess I will have to show you the lower bound example for you to believe it. We have 13 different resources. The notation is slightly different than before. Now the number in each resource denotes its cost per number of players choosing that resource. So a resource with cost function 4x is denoted with just a 4. The red lines denote the possible actions of player 1, the green lines denote the actions of player 2, and the blue lines denote the actions of player 3. In the social optimum the players choose these resources. However, player 2 figures that he can do better. By switching to these resources he incentivizes player 3 to choose these resources instead. That's a lot of overlap with player 1. Since player 1 does not like this he instead chooses these resources. Now player 2 will choose these resources, resulting in player 3 choosing these resources. Did you follow that? It's fine if you didn't. I also don't have intuition for this example. However, if you work out the game tree from bottom to top, you can verify that this is indeed correct. So, if I don't understand the example myself, how on earth did I manage to find it? And how could I possibly prove an upper bound of exactly 1039 over 488? The answer to both questions is linear programming. I managed to construct a linear program that maximizes the sequential price of energy over all possible examples. And even when I tell you it's a linear program, you're probably assuming that I mean mixed integer linear program with a nonlinear objective function. I mean, we're clearly trying to minimize the sequential price of energy. By definition, this is a fraction which is nonlinear. Also, don't we need integer variables to model the binary nature of choosing an action? It turns out that we really don't. Here's how the linear program works. First of all, to make the objection function linear, we define the cost in the social optimum to be 1. Now, when we minimize the total cost in the subgame perfect outcome, we minimize the sequential price of anarchy. This goes without loss of generality, as we can scale the costs of any solution to the linear program. Our decision variables are the coefficients in the cost functions of the resources E. However, which resources are we talking about? Since we're minimizing over all possible examples, is there even a limit to the number of resources? Well, it turns out that there is. To see why, let's first look at actions. In the worst case example, player 1 only needs to have two actions. The action he chooses in the social optimum is visualized in green, and the action he chooses in the subgame perfect outcome is visualized in red. Any other action will not have any effect on the sequential price of anarchy, so we might as well omit them. You might think that player 2 also only needs two actions. Well, player 2 needs at least two actions. The action he picks in the social optimum and the action he picks in the subgame perfect outcome. However, we also need to specify the action that is subgame perfect in the subgame when player 1 chooses his socially optimal action. In the diagram, this is the second action of player 2. You can indeed see that the second edge is red in the leftmost subgame. Finally, for player 3, we need to consider 7 actions. His action in the social optimum 
and his subgame perfect actions in each of the six subgames. So in total, we have to take into account 2 plus 3 plus 7 equals 12 possible actions. Note that these actions are not necessarily different. Some might contain the exact same resources. So, about these resources. How many do we need? Well, the main observation is that if any two resources are contained in exactly the same actions, then they might as well be a single resource with the added latency functions. Therefore, we only need one resource for each possible subset of actions. Since there are 12 actions, there are 2 to the 12 subsets. So our total number of resources is at most 2 to the 12. Now, the cost of any player for all outcomes are completely determined by our decision variables. For example, the cost of player 1 when he chooses action i and the other players choose actions j and k respectively are equal to the sum of constant costs of all the resources in this action plus the variable costs of those resources times the number of players choosing them. For example, if some resource E is in all three action sets, then the constant AE is counted three times. Now, the inequality constraints of our linear program are simply the inequalities that define our subgame perfect equilibrium. For example, one of the inequalities is as follows. If player 1 chooses his second action, represented by the red edge, then he anticipates player 2 to choose his third action and player 3 to choose his seventh action. Since this action is defined to be subgame perfect for player 1, his costs have to be at most his costs when he chooses his first action, represented by the green edge. In that case, he anticipates player 2 to choose the second action and player 3 to choose the third action. This linear program yields a minimum of 1039 over 488. By construction, this is the sequential price of anarchy for a fine three-player congestion games. You may have noticed that the lower bound example I show contains fewer than 12 actions and a lot less than 2 to the 12 resources. The reason for this is that after solving the linear program, I slightly adjusted it to see if I could construct an example with fewer actions while maintaining the same sequential price of anarchy. Most of the resources in the example I found had the zero function as cost function. This makes it possible to visualize the example. All right. I had a lot of fun figuring out this example and I find the number 1039 over 488 truly special. In most problems you don't encounter a number like that. However, the example does indicate that our reason for looking into the sequential price of anarchy was wrong. This concept does not seem to lead to more realistic examples. In a different paper we even found a way to formalize this idea. For those of you familiar with complexity theory, it turns out that finding subgame perfect equilibria in network congestion games is strongly NP-hard, even in the case of only two players. If it is so hard to find a subgame perfect equilibrium, then how can we expect that drivers will actually behave according to their equilibrium strategies? To make matters worse, we then looked into the sequential price of anarchy for more than three players. While the price of anarchy stays 2.5, regardless of the number of players, the sequential price of anarchy doesn't even have a constant upper bound. Well, it is technically upper bounded by the number of players, but when that number approaches infinity, so does the sequential price of anarchy. The partial takeaway message from these results is not that things will get unboundedly bad. The message is simply that the sequential price of anarchy does not indicate rational behavior in congestion games. You may think that I would be bothered by having my new concept not working out. And of course, I would have preferred to invent something that changes the world. However, figuring out that something does not work is also important. This way, I have still made my small contribution to the large amount of research into congestion games. 
And even though the scientific community is still working hard to come up with the right concepts and solutions, we are miles ahead of the Dutch government. I hope you are now also convinced that we should implement road pricing. Please let me know if you have any questions. Well, welcome back, uh, everybody. Uh, thank you for the presentation, uh, Jasper. Well, it, it seems a bit odd that you are presenting on the screen, but we're still sitting here. But um, uh, it was uh, very uh, interesting, and thank well, you. there were a few hiccups uh, in the in the stream, but uh, I uh, heard that it wasn't really a problem. So I I hope uh, that. Uh, everybody uh, understood could understand everything and uh, if not you can look it back later on and it will be published um, let's start with the questions uh, I see a question from Thomas who asks uh, how can you use the models in practice when not everyone has the same starting or ending notes um. Well, you, you, you saw some examples, many of these examples were uh, worst case examples uh, and in that case it just makes the example easier when the starting note and target notes uh, when they're different. But yeah, you can also use these, these models when they are different. Um, but of course you're, you're talking about um, using them in practice. Uh, personally, my, so my personal research didn't really involve um, using them in practice in the sense that I, I didn't actually compute road pricing. Uh, for me, it was just diagnostics, figuring out uh, how bad can things get. Yes, okay, and, and to show that it should really work, road pricing. Uh, mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Uh, I don't see any other question yet, but I, well, we were talking uh, during the presentation also about uh, this topic and why does uh, well if it's so mathematically clear that it's it's a good idea to do row pricing why didn't it happen well maybe there should be more mathematicians in uh, in politics and then we could convince them with this uh, hard uh, arguments more and and leave out some other sentiments uh, but um, well, I still, th well, uh, I work for the, the Rijkswaterstaat actually, so uh, I, I saw these projects on road pricing and I think that uh, it's still not a, a lost cause. Maybe there will be some something in the future. And I was also thinking during your presentation, maybe uh, it could be applied in uh, uh, not with road pricing, but in the advice we give uh, people uh, on their route. So now we have these signs from uh, go uh, this way or that way. Um, and now all, everybody uses his, his, his Tom Tom and Navigator. So could it be that this could help the, 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 the navigating software or could be implemented there? Yes, so this is this is another way. So, um, yeah, so in one sense, the go uh, we can fix the price of anarchy if the government uses road pricing. Uh, on the other hand, it can also be, be done with navigation software, but this is quite tricky uh, because, for example, if you look at the, the very first example, Brace Paradox, um, the current uh, the current software would probably advise everyone to to take the zigzag route. Uh, and in that sense, uh, it doesn't help. So what the government would want is software that tells uh, half the people to, to take the top route, half the people to take the bottom route. But then the problem is um, the people, as, as soon as, as someone figures out, hey, the zigzag route is better for me, they're just not going to stick to the, to the navigation software. Uh, and maybe there's even, uh, there's going to be companies who realize, hey, the, the government is giving advice that's best for society. We're making navigation software that's best for the individual users. Uh, and that's going to sell because everyone wants to, to have the, uh, the best deal for themselves. So it's, it's something we, we have to take into account. Uh, probably something would work with software that's, um, that's usually best for the, for the user, but not always. In that sense, hopefully we can steer society in the right direction. Yeah, well, I think that would be a very interesting direction to, to go to and, and maybe new technology will make it more easy to uh, apply it. 
So thank you. I see that we also have a new question on the, on the chat. Manoy asks, how does road pricing in practice help to achieve the social optimum? Uh, yeah, so, um, I, so uh, at the start I gave this example, um, again with, with Brazil's paradox, where you can just uh, use road pricing to, to really disincentivize uh, people from using the road segments that you don't want to be used. Um, but yeah, uh, in practice, uh, in the Netherlands, it hasn't been implemented yet. Uh, I heard that they did implement it in, uh, I think it was uh, Singapore. But yeah, you, you, you can look up things on the internet, how they use it. Uh, I think in practice, it's, it's a lot easier than the complicated uh, models I use. Um, I think practically, often you can just simply see, oh, this is a road where often uh, traffic jams occur. Uh, let's make it more expensive and then it might just go right. Of course, it could go wrong. Uh, it would always help, but I think generally it's it's better than doing nothing, as is the case right now. And I think you also gave a yes, nice yes, example. Yes, I had an example. Uh, we, uh, well, I work with the Rijksraadstaat, so I, um, we do uh, maintenance on roads. So sometimes we have to close roads or repair bridges. So I know that in one bridge uh, that was closed for about a uh, half a year, they uh, uh, invited all people that would take that bridge every day for work. They invited them to uh, use the bridge, not on the peak hours, but they, they got a, a kind of fee when they didn't use the bridge during peak hours. So they had to start extremely early at work or, or, or work at home for a few hours and then uh, come after 10 o'clock. And that exp that was actually used, and it it really worked. So I think it it can have, yeah, it does have potential uh, for such certain projects. So, and and technology may uh, be improving for the application. I see that it's that that we don't have time for any more uh, questions now. That so it's it's time for the for the lunch break. Uh, well. The, the, since we had this delay in the morning, the, the lunch break uh, will be uh, well will be almost the same time, but uh, we will start a bit later. So we will start again uh, at a quarter to two. But during the lunch break, you can have this chat in this uh, business uh, expo, so you can can ask your questions to the the companies involved. So, so use it. Uh, we will uh, restart the stream also uh, during the break, so to make sure that we don't have any hiccups after the break. So have a nice break and see you back at the quarter to two.
Well, welcome back everybody after the break. I hope you had a nice lunch and um, well, we uh, will be starting the next uh, presentation soon. But first I want to welcome Martijn here in the studio. Uh, Martijn uh, is also in the committee. Com Martijn, what's your business? Yeah, so I'm the treasurer of the committee and uh, I uh, arranged everything uh, from the incoming and outgoing uh, money and uh, yeah, next to that, I also mailed a lot with uh, speakers, a lot with study associations. So I did a lot of things, but my main function was a uh, treasurer indeed. So and are, are you making a, a loss or profit or even? Yeah, um, well, <laughs> uh, I estimated to have a lot of hiring costs because we first of all had a nice location here in Enschede. But uh, those costs are not made right now, so currently we're making a small profit, probably. Okay, well, that's good news. Well, then, that, then, then this disadvantage of online uh, has some advantages uh, also. Well, okay. Well, uh, we are going uh, to listen to the presentation of uh, John Einmal. He's professor of the statistics in T at Tilburg University. And he uh, published a lot of research on statistics and uh, probability. He uh, also published some famous papers on the ultimate athletic records and on human lifespan. And human lifespan is also the subject he is uh, going to uh, present uh, this afternoon. And he will answer the question we are all wondering, is there an upper limit to our our age, people getting are getting older and older, and will this be going on forever, or is there a, an end to life? So, John, bring it on. This is uh, John Einmal. I'm a mathematician, and I'm a professor of statistics at uh, Tilburg University. Thank you for the for the kind invitation uh, to talk at this uh, for me special uh, symposium. I'm going to talk about uh, limits to human lifespan through extreme value theory. And my talk is based on a joint paper with uh, Jason Einmal, Einmal, who is my son, and who uh, did take the metrics in, uh, in uh, Tilburg, and Lawrence de Haan, who is a professor at the Erasmus University in uh, Rotterdam. The paper I'm going to talk about uh, appeared in the Journal of the American Statistical Association uh, two years ago. So it's about uh, human lifespan, and the human lifespan is the time for a human from birth to death. So it's basically the age at uh, death. And we consider the lifespan of a human being as a random variable. And the question, the main question we have in this talk is whether the support of the probability distribution of this random variable has a finite or a right endpoint or not or simpler in layman's language, what's the maximal age that people, Dutch people can reach? Is there such a limit or can every age be reached in principle? There are two phrases in the title. One is this human lifespan and the other is extreme value theory. So I first will talk about extreme value theory and then I will come back to the question of how old people can get, so I will apply it to the human lifespans. Extreme value theory is about how fast, how high, how much, how old, and so on. So it's about statistical questions, about extreme events. So we are not so much interested in averages, what we typically do, but we are interested in very large or very small values. A very standard example that's basically where it uh, started is how high the dikes in the Netherlands should be in order to protect us against extreme water levels. And here we disregard a once in 10,000 year storm. So we cannot say we want a probability of zero, but we want a very small probability of a, of a flood. And the question is then how high should the dikes be? So we are not interested in the average water level, but we are interested in these flood levels. A few other questions. How large should the capital buffer of a financial institution be for bad times? 
what will be the price of a painting at an auction. So for an auction, you have all these bits, and it's not about the average bit, but it's about the maximal bit. Not so close to Twente, but from Tilburg, a little bit in the direction of uh, Twente is, how strong can an induced earthquake in the province of Groningen be? Can it be just a little bit higher than what we have experienced so far, or can it be much higher? What will be the total insured loss of the first hurricane topping Katrina or topping Harvey? How much can we lose on one day on a certain portfolio of stocks? Again, disregarding a probability of one over 1,000. What can we say about extreme rainfall? How fast can we run? Well, we. How fast can some people run the 100 meters? And the question of this talk, how old can we get? Can we get older and older? We know that, uh, that uh, the pension age, the retirement age has increased over the years. So on average, we are getting older, but this is also applied to the very, very old people. So this is about, uh, all these questions were about extreme value theory. Let me tell you a little bit about this. When answering the questions, just ask, you need extreme value theory, which I uh, abbreviate with EVT. It's indispensable. EVT is a subfield of probability theory and mathematical statistics. So you can also say it's a subfield of mathematics that addresses and provides solutions to problems of this type. And what is it? It's an ingenious extrapolation method to draw conclusions about things, about events, that are so far away from what we uh, normally see or experience that we have not seen them before. So therefore it's extrapolation. And in this symposium we talk about limits. Uh, when you do EVT, limits are everywhere. Even the, the basic assumption in EVT is based on a limit relation involving the cumulative distribution function of the data. So therefore, in order to make uh, statistical procedures work, we should not use all, all the data, but the limit relation is about some, some, some variable x, say, going to the endpoint of the distribution, which can be finite or infinite. Uh, but anyway, whatever it is, we need to base our procedures only on the larger data. We call them the larger order statistics. This is, this is a symposium in mathematics, but I realized that it's too complicated to tell the underlying mathematics to you in, uh, in uh, 30 minutes or 45 minutes. Uh, but there is a lot of mathematics uh, behind it, and uh, I only show you uh, one, uh, one slide of, of, a, of a paper of mine, or one page of a paper of mine, just to, to, to see that it is just, uh, just the mathematics you are used to, or maybe some of the mathematics that you're not used to. But instead of going into the formulas, I will uh, explain things by, uh, by pictures. So what do you see here? You see three top 40s, and on the left, you see the top 40 of old people in the Netherlands uh, for a certain period. So on the, on the top line, uh, so it's, it's like a histogram, on the top line you see the oldest person, then you get the second oldest, and on the 40th line you get number 40. And what you see is that, roughly speaking, all these people died at about the same age. There are only small differences. It's not that the oldest person is 10 times as old as number 40, but it's about the same. If this is the case, we talk about a light tail of the distribution or a light tail of the data. In the middle, you see uh, worldwide, uh, you see losses of uh, natural and man-made disasters. This is again the top 40. And what you see there is that the top uh, observation, that it is about twice as large as the second observation and so on. And if you compare number one with number uh, 40, you see that even if you look at the ratio or the difference, that there is a huge difference or a huge ratio. And on the right, this is the top 40 of earthquakes in Groningen. Uh, you see that it's even, even uh, uh, stronger, this uh, larger, this difference. The num number one is 
much higher than number 10 and number 10 again is a, is much higher than uh, than than the last one which seems to be very small and it is uh, it is very small so that's that's uh, that's crucial in extreme value theory uh, heavy tails and uh, and light tails so on, on the right and in the middle we have a heavy tail and on the light we have on the left we have a light tail the most important number in uh, extreme value theory is the extreme value index. And the extreme value index, we uh, typically denote it with gamma, is a real number. So that number can be positive, it can be zero, or it can be negative. And this index shows how heavy the tail of the data, say of the lifespans is. The larger the gamma, the heavier the tail of the data. A large gamma means that there is a lot of risk involved, that it is a very uncertain uh, distribution in the tail. And if the gamma is small, that means that this is not the case, like for the, for the lifespans. Gamma is a real number, so it can be minus 10, it can be plus 1 million. But in practice, for basically all the data sets I know, the gamma runs from minus 1 half to about 1, and occasionally, uh, it's a bit higher even it can run to one and a half but i don't know real data sets without a transformation where the the gamma is minus one or where it's plus three or something like that let me give you some examples of uh, the extreme value index first we go to the examples on uh, page nine that we just saw uh, on the left uh, you see the human lifespans and there the gamma is about minus 0.15. That's a light tail, the gamma is negative. In the middle, uh, we had the losses of natural and man-made disasters worldwide, the top 40. And there the gamma is around one half. And on the right, you see the energy of the earthquakes in Groningen. And there the gamma is very high. Uh, it's about one and a half. Some more examples. When you look at losses at the stock market for a certain portfolio or for an index, we often find a gamma which is about 0.3, which means that there is a lot of uncertainty, that there is a, a heavy tail. If we look at the high water levels at the Dutch coast, the gamma is slightly negative. So it's negative, but it's close to zero. And for the 100 meter running, men or women, uh, the data look a little bit like uh, what we have seen for the lifespans and the gamma is about minus 0.15. Uh, when you do mathematical research, you try to publish in the, in the top journals and you have this uh, very uh, uh, complicated uh, papers full of uh, formulas and uh, derivations and so on. And you are happy if a few uh, read your uh, paper when it's published, maybe five or maybe 10 or maybe 50 or maybe 100. But the nice thing of this research on human lifespan is that it, uh, apart from the, the scientific literature, it also popped up everywhere. So it was in the media. Uh, we traced it back to uh, at least 100 countries and uh, at least 1,000 newspapers website news sites and uh, and so on so this is a uh, this is a, a dutch one and uh, this is uh, an english one or an american one and this is uh, russian i think uh, i know see how my my name is written and the name of uh, jason in uh, in uh, in russian but it uh, basically popped up uh, everywhere so we go back to the maximum human lifespan and let me begin a little bit formal the text from the paper there is no scientific consensus on the fundamental question whether the human lifespan has an upper limit or an upper right endpoint or not and if so whether this upper limit changes over time so do people get older and older if there is an upper limit, questions are how to estimate it and how large is it? And you understand this is 
as mathematicians, but uh, we are talking about probability distribution, but still it's important to, uh, to emphasize that the upper limit is not the highest observed age at that, but the highest age that possibly could be reached. So let me tell you a bit about the data we have. We have very precise mortality data. We got them from the Dutch uh, Statistics Office, the CBS, CBS. And we have ages at that in days, so that's very precise, of basically all people we wanted. And we have uh, 285,000 data for all Dutch residents born in the Netherlands who died in the years 1986 through 2015 at a minimum age of 92 years. And even all these data we will not use. I will tell you in a second. So people that pass away at a younger age than 92, which is the majority, they are not relevant because extreme value theory, as I said before, is based on the limit relation. For each year from 1986 to 2015, we consider the people who died in that year. So we have 30 data sets, the people who died in 1986, who died in 1987 and so on. And we see the people who died in such a year as a random sample from the population of all people who could have died in that year. And as demographers uh, told me or told us, we should consider men and women separately. So that's what we, uh, what we do. So here you see a summary of the data for uh, women. So you see six columns on the right and every column uh, is about five years. So the first column is from 1986 to 1990 as year of death. And the most right column is from 2011 to 2015. And on, the, on every row, you see the age at that. So on the bottom, you see people who died at age 92, 93, and 94. The next uh, row, the row above that is 95, 96, 97, and so on. And what you see is if you look at the lower rows, look even at the row from 98 to 101, you see that if you uh, move in time from the left to the right, so these are very old people. I'm not talking about retirement age, but I'm talking about very old, old people, about 100. When they die, you see that on the left there is 2,300, 2,400, and on the right there is uh, 6,900. So it almost uh, tripled. So here this number is about three times as high as this number. If you go to the higher ages, the very high ages, uh, for instance, here you see very... Uh, low numbers, they are unreliable, but you also see that there is no trend. It's two, two, three, two, six, three. It's all the time around three. And if you go to the very high ages, 113 to 116, you see that it's all the time zero, except in the for the years uh, 2001 to 2005, it's two. So these are the these are the raw data. And let me tell you a bit more about them. Uh, so the oldest person in these uh, 30 years was Hendrikje van Andel. She, lives, she lived most of the time in Drenthe, a woman, and she died at the age of 115 years and uh, a little bit, uh, 60, 60 days or so. And what we thought, want to find out is for each year of death, so for each of the 30 years, if the human lifespan has an upper limit or not. And in case there is such an upper limit, uh, we want to see if these upper limits uh, show some trend over the 30 years we consider. We will only uh, talk about women, or mainly talk about women, and at, then at the end, I will briefly discuss uh, and compare with the results for men. So we are going to apply EVT, extreme value theory, is based on the limit relation. We are not looking at all the data, which are, were already the, the top order statistics, the very old people in a, in a sense, but for every year of that, we only look at the top uh, 1,500 women. So we take the 1,500 oldest women per year of that. So that means we have 30 years, 
that we have that we take into account about 45,000, well, not about, exactly 45,000 ages. Of about, there is the about, the 2 million women that died in those 30 years. So that's a, a very small percentage, a bit more than 2%. And that's an important feature of EVT. We don't use all the data, but we only use the, the larger order statistic, the larger data. So we only use a small fraction of the total. There is one, for our research, very important but very basic lemma, it's not even a theorem in EVT, which says that if the extreme value index is negative, then the distribution has an upper limit. So if you apply this to the lifespans, it means that, the upper that there is an upper limit to the lifespans. If the gamma is positive, it means that the distribution doesn't have an upper limit, so it, it, it runs to infinity. And if the gamma is zero, then both can happen. But if you can show that the gamma is negative, then you know that there is an upper limit. So what we are going to do is we are going to check if all the 30 extreme value indices for the 30 years we consider, if they are less than zero. And we simply number the years now, not 1986 and so on, but we just call them one, two, three, one, two, three up till 30. We estimated the extreme value indices. You see them, uh, you see them here for the, for the 30 years, and you see that they are cl clearly below zero. They are kind of oscillating from about minus 0.1 to about minus 0.2, uh, a little bit less. And on average, they are about minus 0.15. That's what you, what you see here. But these are the estimates. And it can be that the estimate is minus 0.1, but it can be that the true value is, uh, is positive. And we want to show that it's negative. So we need to do statistics and we need to do a hypothesis test. We constructed one hypothesis test for dealing with all the 30 years. So we do not 30 tests, that's important, but we do just one test. And the alternative hypothesis is that all the gammas are negative. And the null hypothesis is that at least one of the gammas is greater than or equal to zero. And we could show with this test with a very small p-value, if you're familiar with that, that indeed we reject the null hypothesis. So that means that all the lifespans, lifespans are uh, the, all the lifespans have an upper limit. So that means that we cannot reach every age, but we are limited to the endpoint of the distribution. But then, of course, you want to know how long uh, can we live? What's the what's the maximum? Uh, human lifespan. And here is the, the main picture of my talk, and I'm going to explain that. Let's first look at the lower curve, which is the, the gray curve uh, over here. The gray curve is the age of death at number 1500. So the 1500 woman each year. And this age of death for number 1500 runs from 1950 sorry, from 95.3, which is uh, the, for the year 1986, uh, to 98.7 for the year 2015. So, so there is an increase of 3.4 years, which is about uh, 0.1 year per calendar year. So that means that not only the people at retirement age or at average age that they get older and older but it also means that very old people almost 100 years of age at least more than 95 that they get older and older over the years but if you look at the black curve let's call it curve uh, then you see that there is no trend it uh, oscillates uh, but it oscillates around the value 110. It doesn't go up or down, at least not for the 30 years, but it goes a little bit up and down 
but on average, you would say it stays at 110. So that's uh, that's what we uh, what we see here. So the average uh, age of that of the oldest woman in the Netherlands is 110. Then we go to the blue curve, and also the text is in uh, in blue, and that's the estimate for the uh, for the endpoint of the distribution. So for the upper limit of the lifespan. And again, you see visually, but we have also confirmed that by regression analysis that there is no trend. There is some oscillation, but there is no uh, no trend. So the oldest people and the endpoint of the distribution they are not increasing, but they uh, they just uh, fluctuate a bit. Here are the numbers. On average, for the 30 years we consider, we get an average estimated upper limit of 115.7. And the largest one is uh, it's this one. It's 123.7. By the way, here is uh, Hendrik van Andel in year uh, 20, which is uh, 2005. Uh, that's the year that she died, and she's the oldest of all the. the she, she's the maximum of the, the black uh, curve. When you estimate something, you make an error. So you uh, typically work then with, uh, with uh, confidence intervals. Here we are uh, looking at, at upper limits. So it's better to take a, a one sided confidence interval. We took 95%. Uh, one-sided confidence intervals and what you get then is the red curve so these are upper uh, upper confidence uh, limits and then you are uh, a bit more safe because you you then catch you know that the uh, true value is with a probability of uh, with a confidence of 95 percent it's below the the red point but you have to be careful here because this we did uh, for every year. So every year it's 95%, but you should have a bound for all the years together, which we, which we didn't do. Anyway, the average of the red, uh, more prudent uh, estimates is uh, about 120. So what we see is that uh, very old women get older and older, but the lifespan spans of the annual oldest and the estimated upper limits they do not increase over time. Also they, also, they do not decrease over time. But that would be a surprise if they would have done that. Now we look at, at uh, two uh, related uh, quantities. One is the force of mortality. I could give you uh, a formal definition of that. Uh, the force of mortality is also called the hazard rate or the failure rate. And sometimes it's called the instantaneous probability of dying, although it's not exactly a probability. But when you measure time in days, the force of mortality is approximately the probability that you die the coming day. So how much does... <laughs> how much pressure is there of mortality? The younger you are, the, the, the lower this is. So we could uh, estimate this at the theoretical time of that. I will not explain that in detail, of the oldest woman for a given year. And that then we found uh, a force of mortality. And we took the average over the 30 years we consider of about 3 divided by 1,000, so 0.003. We could also uh, calculate it uh, one year uh, before the estimated endpoint of the human lifespan. That's, that turns out to be later. That's not so clear. So the force of mortality is higher. And then you get a force of mortality of about uh, 0.02. Another uh, related quantity, which is less well known, uh, is the perseverance parameter. And what's that? Uh, we look at a person of high age, of, so a very old person. And then we look at the maximum residual lifetime. So that's the endpoint of the distribution minus that high age. So if the endpoint is 116, 
and the person is uh, 112, say, then the maximum residual lifetime is four years. And we are interested in the fraction of this maximal residual lifetime on average. So how much of the maximal residual lifetime is used on average? And we find, and all this is linked to extreme value theory, also the, the force of mortality. I, I didn't give you the, the, the details. We find an average estimate of about 12%. So when you're very old, you use on average about 12% of uh, the time that's maximally given to you. We forgot about the man. Let's, uh, let's uh, come back to the man. Uh, the results for men are qualitatively similar. Uh, we also did the hypothesis test that I told you about for the women. We also did this for the men and we got the same result. So we found that the 30 endpoints are finite. So again, there is a maximum to human lifespan. On average, uh, men uh, die younger. So that means that if you look at very old people, there are, there are not so many men as, uh, as women. And therefore, we took not the top 1,500, but we took only the top 1,000 for the estimation. The average endpoint estimate we found for men is 140.1, so slightly lower. And when we look at the average 95% confidence bound, which is a little bit wider now because we, we, took, we have less data, we find also about 120, but just below 120. So the difference between uh, men and women is only 1.6 years. And these are only estimates, so it's not very much. If you look at the average, average age of that during the 30 years we consider, we see a difference of more than five years. So that means when you're a man and you are very old, then in terms of residual lifespan, you can compete with women. When you're a man and you're just born, then you cannot compete with them. So the residual lifespans of very old men and very old women, they are about the same. And that's essentially the end of my talk. I would like to wrap up. So what we showed is, uh, using extreme value theory is that there, are, there is an upper limit to the lifespan of humans and that this upper limit also does not change over the 30 years we considered. However, the number of people reaching very high age, say getting older than 95, uh, increases rapidly uh, and it kind of tripled in the last 30 years. The average uh, upper limit that we found for the years we considered is 116. And if you are a little bit, uh, if you want to be a little bit more safe, uh, take some, some, some uh, confidence uh, limits into account, then it is uh, maybe 120 or 125 or even slightly higher. But it's not 200. It sounds, uh, this sounds funny maybe, but some people say that there is no, no limit to human lifespan so that you can uh, become 1,000 or so. So what people ask me, does that also apply to, to uh, the people in the audience, uh, mainly uh, students? Uh, of course, when you do statistics, we use data from the past, from the recent past in our case. So the results are valid for the years we looked at but there of course we have all the data so it's a kind of uh, theoretical but we think that the results also hold for the near future so for the people who will die in the next 10-20 uh, years but not necessarily if there are any uh, big medical changes for people that die in 100 years from now so my talk was very applied uh, 
typically my 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 presentations are highly uh, theoretical so this is in a sense an, uh, an outlier but i want to tell you which i didn't show you is that extreme value theory is mathematically very interesting and challenging so there is a lot of interesting mathematics there and it can also and i showed that a little bit in the beginning of my talk it can be also be applied to uh, to many other uh, other fields of application thank you very much Well, thank you, John. That was really interesting. Um, I was not aware of uh, extreme value theory. It wasn't in my curriculum uh, during uh, my uh, study. So uh, I, I think it's very interesting. And, and maybe it's, uh, there are some uh, more uh, applications uh, in the risk analysis field I am uh, working in. So uh, thank you very much. You mentioned uh, in the beginning that you had a lot of publicity uh, uh, as a result of your uh, publications, also in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the papers, but did it also uh, lead to uh, the, all this attention to some serious contacts with, for instance, uh, life insurance uh, companies or pension funds? Are they also interested in this subject? Um, I, I, I don't know if it is because of the publicity, but I have some uh, some contact with uh, with insurance companies uh, uh, and uh, also with financial institutions, and it's it's kind of well understood uh, that extreme value theory plays a role there. You, you it, it is essentially uh, about risk management. Yes. And uh, you, you, you want to know yeah, what a few of the questions I mentioned in, in the beginning about uh, about insurance and uh, also about uh, losses you can have on a certain portfolio and so on. Uh, I'm not uh, really solving uh, practical problems. I'm working more on the methodology, but I, I, I have some contacts there and sometimes I give them an uh, in-house in course uh, about extreme value uh, theory. Okay, thank you. Uh, then uh, we go to the questions in the in the chat. Um, I think this chat. I I, I they, they just took it away. Yeah. So th then, Martijn, you g I gave you the turn to to ask your first question. Yes, John. Thanks for the talk. Um, I was questioning. Uh, it's a known fact that uh, people get older and older nowadays compared to let's say 100 years ago. Uh, if you had more data, would you expect that the, the upper limit of the human lifespan would be higher? Um, so I could go uh, back in time and then the, your question is, would the lifespan, the maximum lifespan 100 years ago, would that be lower? So that would mean that it increases over time. And many people, and I think also you, you, uh, you, you, you think that that's the case. I do not have a scientific answer there because I don't have data from uh, from people who died 100 years ago. But I know about uh, the, the the advantage with extreme value theory is when you know when you have one observation. You typically you cannot do statistics when you have only one observation. But when you have one observation, if one person gets 100 years old, then you know that the endpoint of the distribution is more than 100 years. And uh, it turns out that the first validated supercentenarian, uh, as it's called, uh, was a Dutch person, and this is, uh, I've written it down here, Pierre Adriaans Bonkaart, and sometimes I have it on the slides, but this time I didn't, and uh, he died in 1899, so that's about uh, 100 years ago compared to the data uh, I consider, and he died at an age of a little bit more than 110 years, 110.4. So that means that even then, 100 years ago, or more than 100 years ago, the endpoint of the distribution was more than 110. So that means that if there is, if there has been an increase over the last 100 years, it's not very large, and maybe there is no increase at all. So certainly, average ages, average lifespans, they have changed, they, they have increased a lot from 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 very low. 30, 40 years even some time ago till about 80 years now. So that, that kind of doubled. But the very, uh, the very old people, they haven't gotten any older or certainly not much older. But of course, I have no data from the, from the 19th century. 
But, the, but there are some there are some cases, uh, but but that they are not validated as demog demographers call it from even uh, ancient times, so 2,000 years ago, where people uh, were more than uh, 100 years old. But I do not know how, how reliable these are. Okay, thank you. I think the question from Pascal in the chat is also related to this. He asks, since the dawn of mankind uh, until now, the age of the eldest person has risen. Has it happened gradually or within spikes when certain medical uh, advancements were made? So, yeah, this, this, this I don't know, of course. Uh, this is in line with what I just uh, answered yeah. to, the, to the previous question. But uh, it looks like, uh, again, we don't have reliable data, data from long ago, but, it, but, but it's not so clear that it has risen over time. And maybe it's kind of, uh, it has been more or less constant the last 1,000 or 2,000 years. Yes, maybe so only the, the, the average is rising, but not the end. The average is rising, but not the, not the end point, yes. Okay. Janet asks, uh, since there's a positive trend for the 1,500 oldest, but no trend for the actual oldest, does that mean that m more and more people fall into the grey-blue interval in the graph? That's the graph, I think. It more and more people, the question is if more and more people fall in the blue interval in the graph, but what's the blue interval in the graph? There is a, there is a blue graph, which is a kind of curve, but what, what kind of interval is the, is the question about? I think that, well, uh, well, I'm not sure because <laughs> we, didn't, we didn't ask the question, <laughs> no, but sorry. now you took 1,500 people for this uh, graph. And for men, you took uh, thousands because yes. there are less old men. So does it mean that there are more and more people in, in this graph than before in the top segments? The, so, so, so if you take a, a high age, say 100 years or 95 years, then there are more and more people, people exceeding this, uh, this age, yes. I, I, I'm not sure that this is the... Yeah, it says that the gray, the gray blue uh, interval, so... Yeah, uh, so the, the, the gray one increases and the blue one is uh, oscillating, but it's kind of more or less constant. Mm -hmm. So the, 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 I, I understand, so the interval from, from uh, uh, gray to uh, blue becomes smaller. Okay, okay. yes, I think, okay. And uh, then we have another question from Mandy. Uh, you mentioned that the uh, 1500th oldest woman gets older, then therefore women get older. But can this not be caused by an increase in population instead of a higher probability of getting older? Uh, no, no, this is... Uh Indeed, it's, it's for a small part, it's due to the, the, the increase in population, but the, e e even if, if we uh, would take that into uh, account, we have not done so, but, but then still there would be an increase. So it's, it, it's really increasing, people are getting older, and it's only partially uh, due to the fact, uh, for only for a small part, for the fact that more people died in 2015, which was our last year of research, than uh, 1986. But that, that was only about 10% uh, uh, or so, the increase of uh, people who, uh, who died. Something like that. Okay, thank you. Martijn, do you have another question? Yeah, so uh, in the extreme value theory, you took the, the 1500 uh, eldest uh, woman but the 1,000th eldest uh, men, and you compared them to each other. Is that even allowed to do? Is there a, a, a thing in extreme value theory that you can just compare those? Yes, that's, uh, that's not a problem. So in, a, in extreme value theory, we do something, uh, something unusual. 
we don't use all the data, but we use only a top uh, a, a top part of the data. So 1,500 for the for the women and 1,000 for the men. And these I sometimes call the effective sample sizes. So it's not a real sample size, but it's the, the sample size that you that you use in your uh, in your research. But in general, in statistics, if you if you want to compare two uh, two things, whatever two parameters or whatever, you have uh, you have two samples, uh, sample one and sample two. Then typically the sample sizes are not the same. Typically, they are, why 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 would they be? Only if you control it yourself, you can say I have 500 here and 500 there. But if you don't control it, it can be that you have uh, 1,000 sick people and uh, 100,000 healthy people, and that you want to compare them. And uh, yeah, so working with two different sample sizes, that's uh, that's uh, generally uh, that, that that that's usual in the in the so-called uh, two-sample problem. The more data you have in general, the better the, the better your uh, the smaller your confidence intervals. So the the lowest sample size that kind have has the largest effect on the on the quality of estimation. So for the men, the, the estimation is a little bit less precise than for uh, than for women. But, but 1,500 and 1,000, they are pretty close. It can also be that you have 50 and, uh, and 50,000, for instance. That also works. Okay, thanks a lot. Okay, thank you. And then John mentions that he saw that the number 4 to 10 in the top 10 oldest people are all 170 years. And that the oldest one ever was 122. Isn't it weird there is a big gap between, uh, or big, but a <laughs> gap of five years <laughs> between those yeah. two? Um, yeah, I only looked at, uh, at Dutch people, and there I think the gap was not uh, that large. Uh, this, is, uh, this is about uh, worldwide data. The, 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 the leading one is a, a French lady, lady who uh, uh, became 122. And I, uh, it was funny, I once saw her on television and she lived uh, when she was still alive and she, she lived in the same village as Vincent, Vincent van Gogh, so she commented on him, she, she still remembers him. <laughs> that, 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 that's not uh, the thing. Uh, y yes, I would expect, I mean, there is always randomness, especially if you only look at uh, three or four data points. But the, the gap between number one and number two is kind of, um, there is nothing wrong there, but it's kind of uh, uh, large. I would have expected it to be, uh, to be smaller. Okay, thank you. And uh, Manoy asks uh, if the gamma value, uh, a, a property of ex experimental data set, is it a property of experimental data set or is it of the underlying distribution? Uh, I, I don't know exactly what she means with experimental data set, but it is a, a property uh, of the distribution. So, so if you have a distribution function and you're sampling or you're simulating from that distribution function, when you're uh, sampling from it, you, you, you typically don't, do not know the truth. That's why you do statistics. But then we assume that the underlying distribution function uh, that, it, that it satisfies this limit relation of extreme value theory, and then the gamma is determined. You don't know it, but there is a gamma, which is a real number. So it's a property of the distribution, and you try to estimate it through the data. Is that clear? Yeah, I think so. I think it answers the question. Yeah. And this is also uh, the last question. So uh, uh, thank you very much again. Yeah. And. Um, yeah. <laughs> so now we have a small break again. Uh, you will see the countdown uh, after uh, afterwards, so then you can see when we start again for the the next presentation. See you after. The
Well, welcome back everybody after this uh, short break. We had a change on the couch again and uh, now we have uh, Niels here. Niels was also the one who uh, asked me to join. Yeah. But uh, so Niels, what is your... Uh... Yeah, so uh, I had uh, contact with external parties as an officer of external affairs. Um, so I asked uh, companies and universities if they would be willing to contribute financially to the organization of this symposium. And I asked Tineke if she wanted to be the host of uh, this day. And uh, so I had a lot of uh, email contact with uh, people and uh, made sure that we had some money to spend. So were you also the one who uh, contacted uh, Optifair to uh, sponsor this? Uh yeah, so initially we sent out uh, emails to a lot of companies and uh, Optifair was actually one of the first to respond uh, that they want to be the main sponsor of the event, which uh, was very nice uh, to have. Yes, because uh, our next speaker also works at uh, Optifair, Dennis uh, Fleurby. He is a trader at Optifair since 2013 and he focuses on trading uh, systems and de development of these systems. Uh, he studied at the Tilburg University and he is uh, uh, taking us with him us, uh, in the syst trading system and how competitive trading systems are and how to uh, optimize the uh, limits of these systems. And his, uh, his, his topics will range with from physics to fairness of the trading system. So fair trade is also uh, part of his uh, presentation. So Dennis uh, uh, started uh, start now. <laughs> Hi there, good afternoon. Today we're gonna talk about trading systems at the limits. My name is Dennis Fleurby, um, and I hold a master's in management of information systems and a bachelor's in software engineering. I graduated in 2007 and I've been working in trading ever since 2008. For the first five years of my career, I've been working as a trader and an engineer at various firms. And ever since 2013, I've joined Optiver uh, in a technology role. I've done a wide variety of things at Optiver, from writing C++ low-level systems all the way to running a quantitative trading department on the technology side. For the last four years of my career, I've been looking at what we call competitive business cases and technical market structure. These are circumstances whereby the latency race or the scaling race or the pricing race is so competitive that it becomes much, much harder to actually compete. I specialize in understanding how these systems work and what the rules are. And with that, try to see if we as Optiver can get a part in that race. Today, um, as part of the, uh, the conference, I want to talk to you about limits uh, and especially about different limits and limits in trading. So first off, we're gonna talk a little bit about, all right, what sort of limits are there? What sort of limits do I think uh, I see in the world of trading? Um, and next to that, before you can actually start discussing some of these limits in trading, you first need to understand trading, what's going on. So chapter three, we'll go into a few of these limits in trading, focusing on, the, on some of the physical limits. And in the chapter four, we're gonna look at, all right, now that we somewhat understand these limits, what is the state of play of the limits in trading? Where are we now? Where, we, where will we go in the future? Um, and what sort of does the world look like from my perspective? Finally, uh, there's time for questions, which will not be in the video, but will be in a different chat program. All right, before we can talk about trading, we need to talk about limits. So I see limits as a sort of a scale between hard and soft limits. And especially for you, I see math limits as all the way down there on that list. Those are hard limits. So if I talk about an asymptote, for example, it, that's a hard limit. No matter how hard you try, you will never reach it. But those hard limits are actually quite rare. There's a sort of another set of hard limits tends to be in physics. Um, speed of light, for example, in a vacuum, also doesn't change very much recently. So that is a practical hard limit to me as well. But after that, it gets less hard. So another limit, or maybe better said, constraint in trading is um, protocols. So protocols are nothing more than a language that one party speaks to the other. If I speak Dutch and you speak English, we're probably not going to get each other very well. Maybe some words, maybe a little bit, maybe you know, non-verbal communication. 
but most of it is not going to make a lot of sense. Same goes for computers. If two computers want to talk to each other, they need to talk the same language. In computer speak, that's called a protocol. And a protocol is also a limit of sorts. I might fudge some of the words and I might change some of the letters, but by and large, two computers might still be able to communicate. So within a certain tolerance, I can change protocols and still talk to other parties. Another limit uh, very much at the forefront of trading is, is the rules and the laws. Trading is one of the most regulated industries in the world. Uh, and these rules are there to protect both the exchange, um, but mostly to protect participants. What we want for trading for exchanges to be is fair places to trade. We need to make sure that buyers and sellers all go home happy so that they will come back and trade more. This trading is a really key element of, uh, of society these days to get efficient pricing. Talking about society, that's sort of the furthest most limit that, that I generally see is that what is sort of acceptable behavior, right? If I go to the cinema and I look at the Wolf of Wall Street, that to me is clearly not acceptable behavior. They are trying to sell things to people who have no idea. Um, behavior in, in, inside the firm is you know, ethically wrong to say the very least. And there's so many wrongs here. So we need to think about what the society actually wants from trading. What, where does it help and where does it go too far? Now, interestingly, if you think about what happens if you breach a limit, um, starting from the top, for example, if you do whatever Leonardo DiCaprio's person did there, you go to jail. It's very simple. You are breaching all sorts of laws and you know, there's no good way to, to, to have that end. Now, if you breach a rule book, um, say you speed, very often it's not immediate jail, it's fines or you know, not allowed to, to, to drive for a while or something like that. It's, it's less extreme. If you breach the limit of say a protocol, there's just gonna be no communication. The other side is not gonna understand you and it's gonna be fairly benign. Now there might be a rule that says you shall only speak a certain language and you still get fined through that, but breaching the protocol by itself simply is not gonna hurt much. Now, the last limit, if you breach that one, it's noble price time, right? If you figure out how to break the speed of light, um, effectively still can communicate, that's a great thing to do. Um, if you figure out how to go through an asymptote, it's probably also a big thing. So the rewards and the risks for different limits are very different. Um, now, before we can talk about limits in trading, we need to talk about trading. And the best way to start learning about trading all the way back in the beginning with two cavemen meeting each other. One has a stick and one has a rock and they want what the other one has. Now, the very most primitive action you can do here is force or threat. You know, the one with the stick can basically say, give me the rock or I'll hit you. And the one with the rock is gonna say, all right, give me your stick or otherwise I'm gonna throw my rock at you. That's probably not the best way. You know, need one of the two is not going to walk away happy from this exchange. So there's got to be a better way. And that's sort of a class we call negotiation. Now, there's, there's three ways to do it. One is called trickery. That is to talk to the other one in such a way that he is going to give you his thing. But it's not completely fair. You got tricked into doing something for the wrong reasons. Um, it can be persuasion. Maybe the one with the, uh, with the stick says to the one with the rock, well, you know, if you give me a rock, I'll give it to charity. They're building a house might be a good way to get that to get that rock but by far the most likely way is a value for value trade so if both of them value the stock equal to the, uh, the stick equal to the rock uh, they can just swap it because both of them have, a, have an equal amount of value back and that's that's fair trading right both parties will walk away from that exchange happily now this type of trading is called barter you trade one thing for another thing uh, but it's not always as easy. So if the one with the rock says, you know, I think my rock is valued at half a stick, the one with the stick can at least give him half the stick. That's, that's easy, just snap the stick and you give the other half. It's not that easy with the rock. So barter is a bit tricky. Um, and to cut a very long story short, they invented money and money is a much easier way to do this sort of trading. So they can just look at the value of these things and exchange the right sort of value. Let's skip forward about 10,000 years um, and we arrive at a Black uh, Friday sale. And this is one of the pictures I've always used for, the, for, for trading lectures because it so nicely illustrates a few of the market forces at play. Obviously, 
um, it still looks a bit like the caveman, right? There's a lot of people running around, grabbing things, uh, wanting to run away with them as fast as they can. So that's, it's not really ordered, but there's two interesting things going on here. The first is, it has to be an attractive price. If Black Friday means we'll double the price, this wouldn't happen, right? So there's gotta be a very attractive price. And the attractive price is there in limited quantities. You can see all these people rushing in to get one of these televisions. If that pile is gone, it's not gonna be a new pile. So all of them want to get in as fast as possible to get that television. And that touches upon two of the most fundamental aspects of trading, uh, of most trading. Price and time. So price in trading is always the most important. If I want to pay more than somebody else, I should be the one that get it. If I'm selling something and I ask less for it, I should be the one selling it. Only if two people have the same price, then a good way to resolve that is by who was there first. Now, let's go talk about that in context of a television. So assume the television from the previous sheet is worth 550 um, euros in this case. It's the list price the manufacturer says, all right, you should sell it for about that amount. <clears throat> Then the store opens and there's two people coming in um, and they're nicely in queue. You know, it's not the wild west like the previous picture, but they nicely queue up um, like you do on a real exchange. Now, at this point in time, there's no television yet, but what the manager does is he brings out a television and says, all right, here's one television. Because these are nice people and they're in queue, the first one in the queue will get that television. That's a problem for the second one because he's not going to be very happy. They missed the trade. There was only one television. Uh, it, came, it went for a certain price and he didn't get it. Now, the way for the second person to be able to get that television is to bid more. So if there's no television yet and the second person said, oh, I see somebody now wanting to buy, uh, pay 550 euros for a television, I'm gonna want to pay 600. And then if the television comes, it goes to you because you were bidding more for the television. That is how most financial markets work. Now, unlike a retail store, which is sort of one way, the retail store sells you something, it doesn't take things back. Financial markets, you can do both things. You can buy and sell. Um, and there's different parties there for different reasons. So on a real financial market, um, you'll find every sort of different participant from farmers, manufacturers, banks, governments, traders, pension funds, maybe you've even traded on a financial market. And there's all sorts of people there for very different reasons. The pension fund needs to pay pension in say 50, 60 years to people. So they're not there for the immediate, they're there for the long term. But maybe you were there with um, buying GameStop and your Robinhood app um, and you're looking to make a quick buck. So there's a very wide spectrum of people on a market for very different reasons. And it also means that um, not everybody does always the exact same thing. Um, some people are just happy to buy it for 50 because they think, you know, in 20 years, it's going to go to 500. So that's good for me. While others are there immediately wanting that television because, you know, they want to watch the next series on Netflix or God knows whatever. So different reasons, different people, all sorts of trading going on. Um, but trading is a very well-defined thing. If a trade happens, a buyer and a seller agree on a price. That's the key element to trading. So if there's a television available for 550, and you walk in and you say, hey, give me that television for 550, there's an agreement. The seller wanted to sell it to you at that price. You wanted to buy it at that price. Everybody goes home happy. In real financial markets, what you very often find is that liquidity, as we call that, is um, not always as big as we want. So in a television store, it's really easy. You just walk in, you see all these televisions, right? They've got plenty of them, no problem at all. Now, if you look on a financial market with a more complicated product or a, a more risky product, people might not want to be willing to sell to you at a low price. They might actually be willing to only sell at a very high price to offset their risks. Same goes for buying. They might be willing to buy your complex financial product because, uh, because you know, ultimately they want it. But because of the risk, they might not want to pay as much for it. What happens then is that, um, for example, in this picture, the sellers would only be at 650 and the buyers would only be at 450. So if you come in and you want to buy, you have no choice but to pay 650 to the first store. Now, firms like Optiverse, um, we're market makers. What we do is we engage with exchanges and we, um, we promise the exchange to always give a specific price. 
range. So we will always guarantee to, in this case, for example, be 50 euros, what we call wide. So the price for which we buy will be 50 euros below the price for which we sell. You see it graphically in this picture um, as we're the first buyer at 550 and we're the second seller at um, 600. Now, remember that trading was always price time. Imagine that we are not the best price, but we go much wider. So we only bid for 50 and we only sell at 650. We simply won't trade. There will be people in front of us. If we don't trade, we don't make any money. We go out of business. So in trading, the only way to make money is to trade. Um, and that means for us is that we always have to have the best prices and we always have to be near the front of the line to buy or sell. The strategy what we deploy is incredibly simple. Um, and it works for most things in life if you want to get rich. You just buy it low and sell it high. So in this case, if the price would never change, we would be very happy to buy for 550 and to sell for 600. Every time we do a buy and a sell, we make 50 euros. So that's, that sounds like a good deal. But it's not risk-free. So there is something called adverse selection. Uh, I don't know if it's a very wide term, but we use it. And we use it to indicate that we didn't actually want to trade at that price. And that happens in cases where prices start to change. So imagine our television, right? And you can see the sort of purple square around 550. The television is still at the list price of 550, but the manufacturer has a new version and they want to sell the old stock. So they want to have a discount on it. So they send out a press release or an electronic message or whatever to the firm selling this, to the, to the shop selling this saying, it's now 500 euros. What can happen is that some of the um, people that can buy and sell on an exchange uh, will look at that information and go as fast as possible to take profit of that. So if you know that this television still is being bid for 550, as you can see here, uh, we still want to pay 550 euros for a television, but you know the new price is going to be 500. So you sort of know what's going to happen in the future. What you can try to do is try to really, really quickly still sell that television. So in this case, the television um, will be tried to be sold for us, but we will see that price as well, maybe not as fast. Um, and then we will also try to change it. We, what we want to do is reprice our prices to the new price of this television. So if the new price is 500 euros, we probably want to make our new price 500 or 450, depends on you know, where we want to be. Now, if we're too slow with that, the fast guy will actually still sell us the television at 550, even though we had a message going towards the exchange saying, oh, please change our price from 550 to 500 or 450. This is a race um, in which the slow party will lose money because if we buy the television at 550 and it's now worth 500, then we've just made a 50 euro loss here, right? <clears throat> that underlines one of our key principles for trading. It's only good if the buyer and the seller agree on the price, and so far it's all the same, at the time of trade. So not when they send the order, but when it actually trades. So if two parties are going to trade and both of them have messages in flight, one basically says, I don't want to trade, and the other one says, please just still try to sell the television at 550. And the one succeeding to sell um, wins than the one trying to change his price loses, right? And that adverse selection is something that we think um, is not a good thing, right? You want to still agree on the price at the time of the trade. So the electronic networks or the communication methods and all that sort of stuff should not be in this equation because there's clearly no agreement on price. We've already indicated to the exchange that we want to change our price, but we're just waiting, uh, waiting for that price. Now, if this happens, we lose money. If it accidentally happens once in a long while, it's not a problem. But what you'll find is that because this is a, a sort of a technology race or, or a different sort of race, is that one party will start to dominate at a certain point and then it becomes structural. If it happens structurally, the only thing you can do as a liquidity provider is to not show your liquidity at that price level. You might still show it much further out. So, you know, we might still show it at 450 to buy or 650 to sell, but we will not be as tight. And that simply means that there is nobody there to offer you a better price. So if you then want the television, um, there's not going to be anybody there at 550 or 600. You're going to pay 650. 
So it's clear by this simple example that if it's not safe to make markets or provide liquidity, the end consumers of these products are going to either pay more or get less if they want to sell. And that's just bad for a market, right? The, the main point of big financial markets is to make it as cheap as possible for everyone to manage their risks. So if you want to have a stock or a television, um, it should be as, as cheap as possible to get in or out of that position. Now, the way to protect ourselves is to do exactly what the fast guy did. We go very tech heavy and we try to build systems that are the fastest in the world so that we can change our price. Um, like the other party tries to build their systems to be the fastest in the world so they can take our price, as that's called. That's a very tech heavy, very expensive race. Another way to approach this is to not do it through the physical limits, who goes who goes fastest, but to do it through the limits of the rules that we discussed before. You can basically make rules on an exchange that says that if somebody who wants to protect the liquidity gets priority over people who want to take the liquidity, because that's very often how, it, how these sorts of races work. So if you do it through rules, there's no need for technology race and all the investments going into technology race can actually be put somewhere else. Maybe you can start making more markets liquid. Maybe you can work on your pricing, provide even better pricing. So there's another way to sort of fix this race. Now, right now, um, this very tech heavy speed race is one of the big dilemmas in trading, right? How much do you need to invest to, to keep on winning here? And as I said, we strongly believe that exchanges Fixing it in the rules is the better way to do it than technology firms fighting it out. So let's go look at this race in slightly more detail. Now, in order to trade, you need two things. First of all, information needs to travel to you because you, before you can make a decision, you need information to, to make a decision with, right? If nothing changes, then there is no need to change. Now, the big question is how long does it take for information to travel from A to B. Uh, the other big thing is that how long do you actually need to interpret that information? You know, you, you're going to look at that information coming in that can be as simple as a, as a price, but it can be as elaborate as a big press update with a lot of text in there. You need to parse that into a decision. Now, am I going to buy? Am I going to sell? Am I going to pull my liquidity? Am I going to do something? Now, that takes time. How much time? That depends on how much processing you need to do. But both of them are the key elements of the sort of technological speed race that's going on. Now, if I look at one of the sort of classical races in Europe, uh, that would be Frankfurt to London. So what happens in Frankfurt is a really large exchange and there's a few very big instruments trading there. In London, there's a few instruments that trade which are highly correlated. That means that if the price in Frankfurt changes, the price in London should also change. Well, you can, you can immediately see that if the price then goes up in Frankfurt, it might be very lucrative for a party to then try to buy in London with the knowledge that the price will need to go up anyway. So this has been a very long running um, speed game between these two exchanges. If I plot this uh, on Google Earth, like I've done here, uh, you'll find that it's 602 kilometers and, and change um, to get from A to B. If I do that um, at the speed of light, so I send the photon all the way to the other side, it's going to take 2.01 milliseconds to get there. And you can't go faster. Or, well, you know, if you know a way, please give me a call. Um, but that's sort of the fundamental physical limit here. Uh, in information propagation, so far as we know, cannot exceed the speed of light. A couple of years ago, old history by now, this took um a trader over in optimized link about 4.22 milliseconds so that link was fiber dug through the earth nearly straight line from frankfurt to to basildon um there was a lot of networks connected and some some fiber manufacturers just made a really really straight line there in 2010. then in 2013 the picture is wholly different so because the speed of light in a fiber is actually slower than the speed of light through the air with a reasonable factor, microwave systems came up. So what you can see here is a picture um, from an independent researcher. So all the information I'm showing you is just available in the internet. You can just Google around and find exactly the same things. Who made uh, a graph of all the microwave links between the 
exchange of Eurex and the exchanges in the UK. And you can immediately see that the latency of that, so to get information from Frankfurt to uh, London, or to specifically Basildon, what I'm talking about, is 2.38 milliseconds. And that's already significantly closer to um, getting towards the, the limit of propagation, which is 2.01. But they weren't done yet. In 2014, this went down to 2.10 milliseconds. And in 2015, this went down to 2.07 milliseconds. That means that this information is traveling at nearly the speed of light in an exactly straight path. Um, the practical limit is very close to the theoretical limit, right? You, you're only a little bit off from the perfect path uh, with these sorts of systems to get information from point A to point B. And this, this, this network is still um, running in Europe. Now, the other half of this is the limit in decision making. And this is easier to comprehend. It's, it's much closer to you. So a little while ago, some game manufacturer made a little, uh, little fun game where you had to react before your Tesla. Um, because it, turns, it turned out that Tesla was taking 300 milliseconds before it was responding to a visual input. And that is the slowest thing in this whole graph. So people are actually faster. They're actually at 0.25, but they don't have the attention span of a Tesla, of course, right? This you can only do if you're fully focused on it. You're not gonna do that for endless kilometers. So in that sense, a person can be faster, but it's not, not as, as good. Now, he takes around a quarter of a second uh, if fully primed and ready to go, which is you know, already pretty fast. But it's nowhere near as fast as the most common animal uh, around being a housefly, right? If you've ever tried to squat a housefly with your hand and you failed, it's because it reacts in 20 milliseconds. You're just not fast enough. You know, by the time it sees your hand move, it's flying off already. It's incredibly hard to capture a fly. Still, we're in the millisecond range here, right? It, this is a fast animal. It's not the fastest animal. The fastest animal, just for reference and fun and games, is the fruit fly. Clocks in at five milliseconds. Um, I've never tried to catch them. Let's go look at trading. So in 2008, um, a good trading system was around 50 microseconds. Um, so 50 millionth of a second. And that was, back then, well, it was a good thing. Around 2010, 2011, 2012, a new generation of hardware came out and that actually brought all of this down to around one microsecond for a trading system, which was pretty fast already. It's a millionth of a second. There's a bit of a gap here um, because it's quite hard to find public information on all the latencies in between. But I did find a very nice presentation uh, from 2018 and the fastest reacting system is at 84 nanoseconds. So that's 84 billionth of a second. 2019 and 2021, that went down to 15 nanoseconds. Now, to me as a human, it doesn't say much. Right? 15 nanoseconds is how much is, you know, it's, it can't be much that, that I'm sure of, but how much is that? And the, the nice reference to it is that if I have a meter of fiber or you know, this length, that takes five nanoseconds. So from the floor to my nose and back is the whole time it takes for that system to get a message, understand what it's saying, and then get a message out, starting to get the message out. That is incredibly fast. Where is this limit? I don't know. It's probably lower. You know, if, if this line goes anywhere, it's downward trend. That brings us sort of to, to fairness, right? Because if there's such fast systems out there, how will we actually make this fair? And fairness, in my view, comes from the top. So we talked about these limits, right? And at the top was Leonardo DiCaprio, and at the bottom was math and physics. But ultimately, at the end of the day, the top needs to decide what we have. And what we decide as a society, I think so far, is that trading has big benefits. It's really easy to, to trade. And with that, you can actually hedge some real risks in, in the world and, and efficiently get into, into sort of the risks that you need as a professional party. But it has to be fair, right? As everybody agrees that trading should not be a rigged game or that there should be a well-known winner or something else. It has to be a fair race for everyone. And that is sort of how society looks at trade. Now that gets encoded in laws and rules. Um, and they, by and large, for all major exchanges come down to this, right? 
all participants in training should have equal access. That means same prices to buy information links, the same latency, the same rights as to how to scale. It has to be all the same. There can't be a party that gets cheaper or, or faster. That's, that's inherently unfair. And that actually gets underpinned by physical reality because if I am an exchange and I want to make it fair and I basically say, all right, you all get the same latency and I'm going to do that by giving you all the same length of fiber. Now, because the speed of light is a constant, if I give everybody the same length of fiber, they're all going to have the same latency towards me. They can still build their own systems that are faster or, you know, anything else, but the exchange itself, that is going to be very, very fair. So this fairness trickles down, right? As a society, we decide, all right, trading is good, but it should be fair. We encode it in rules, and these rules ultimately at a certain point get underpinned by, by the limits of physics. Um, it just takes time to do things. Now, if I look at all these limits in trading, um, the first conclusion I can draw is that usable physics hasn't changed in a while. I see quantum mechanic articles come by once in a while, and it all looks very nice, but it's not going to go faster than the speed of light to carry any sort of reasonable information. So, so far, it seems that that constant that we sort of rely on to make things fair is still there, and it looks like it's going to be there for a while. So that's good. Secondly, technology-wise, we're quickly reaching the end of significance. Um, if you change from, say, the speed of a fruit fly to 50 microseconds and then into 50 nanoseconds, you're getting closer and closer to a sort of absolute, absolute zero point in terms of latency. Now, because communication takes time, it just takes time to speak these words, like a computer takes time to, to put ones and zeros on a wire. As you get closer and closer to the point, it doesn't become any more significant, right? If I'm, if I'm so fast that I'm already faster than, than putting a one or a zero on a wire, then I can double my speed again or half my latency but it doesn't make any difference. So sort of at a certain point, we'll reach, where, we'll reach a point where the technology improvements will not have any more significant advantages. It's just there. Um, so that's, that's going to come quite quickly, we think. Rule-wise, and we're very happy with this one, the landscape is improving fast. So because the speed race has been this fast for the last sort of decade, we've seen a lot of exchanges trying to struggle with what this means to their uh, exchanges. So we've got a lot of liquidity providers like Optiver and a lot of liquidity takers. Um, and they're all racing on this exchange to either try to provide liquidity and be protected or try to take out some of this liquidity and make a, make a profit out of that. That race has been going on so fast that these exchanges are now quickly catching up to encode in the rule books what should actually happen, what is fair. And they're, they're taking a step whereby they don't say, well, you know, we'll just give you an equal length of fiber and that's all they do. They're now taking it one step up in the rule books and basically saying, what is actually fair, right? These people trying to deliver liquidity or these people trying to take liquidity. We actually prefer people providing liquidity because it makes a better book. And if they want to trade, they're definitely going to trade because if they don't trade, they won't be in business for very long, but they don't want to trade in situations where it's, it's sort of an informational race. So there's a lot of changes happening uh, to platforms to sort of encode our, one of our primary, um, primary principles that the trade is only going to happen if the seller and the buyer agree on the price at the time of trade and not anymore that it's just a who has the fastest system. So that's a, that's a really good thing. Um, that limit is, is definitely improving. And finally, you know, I think in society consensus still is the trading has a major benefit. It's, there's just no way to, to improve on that as far as we know. And I'll give you a very simple example because it all sounds a bit fluffy, right? Let's say you're a grain farmer. Um, what's going to happen if you're a grain farmer is that by the end of summer, you're going to make a harvest and all the other farmers are going to do it as well. At that point, because there's so much supply, um, the prices will go down. So by the time everybody wants to start selling their grain to make a profit, it's very low in price. Now, what you can also have is that by the, say, end of winter, the grain supplies will be uh, dwindled and there's going to be a lot more demand and price will be much higher. So what happens actually, and this is how all this sort of commodity trading started, is that if you're a grain farmer and you can make contracts to, to supply grain throughout the year at different points, you can reach a much more stable price. That's good for a grain farmer and it's good for the people buying it, like the bakeries or, uh, I know, brewery. So 
in that sort of sense, financial markets make a lot of economic sense for the people actually supplying things. And this is just one simple example for grain, right? There's so many more examples in the, in the world whereby financial markets just make prices a lot less volatile, much more accessible and much better actually for the people making it. So by and large, there's a big consensus that it has a benefit. Um, and what we also see is that slowly but surely there's going to be less and less excesses in trading. So I'm sorry, Leo, but you know, that sort of story that doesn't fly anymore in 2021. With that, we got to the end of what I have to say. Um, if there are any questions, I'll take them all in time priority. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Dennis, uh, for this uh, introduction into the trade markets. Very, uh, most of it very new for me and uh, very interesting to hear. Uh, and uh, also thank you, your employer, Optifer, for sponsoring this, uh, this, this uh, uh, Congress. And I was wondering, does Optifer also uh, operate only in stock markets or do you also have other markets which you operate? Optimer trades in all um, professional markets. So most people know trading as stock trading. Like everybody has heard of, say, buying a Tesla share or something like that. But most professional trading actually happens in derivatives markets. Um, that's a much more complicated product, uh, very often used by professional parties. Um, Optimer specializes in, in derivatives and then specializes in providing liquidity there. So we, we trade around the world in every major uh, exchange venue. Okay, thank you. Uh, you uh, uh, the chat question, I don't see any chat questions yet, but you can also put questions now in the chat and also related to uh, Optifer. So um, we will, um, s then they will be answered uh, later on. Um, Niels, do you have another question? Yeah, I have a question relating to the other theme of the uh, symposium, because you, uh, touch really well on the limit side of the, the theme of this symposium. But the other theme is that it's the National Mathematics Symposium. So uh, I was wondering, uh, how much mat mathematics do you actually encounter in your work? And uh, what kind of mathematics does Optiver uh, apply in the market making? Yeah, that's a, that's a very good question. So um, the example that I gave is not very math heavy. Like it's all very simple prices, simple compare. So that, that in that sense is not very complicated. But option, um, Optiver is what we call an option market maker. That's a more complicated derivative product. And that actually is fairly mass heavy. So um, a long while ago, um, Blackers saw, saw sort of how to price options. But that wasn't the end of the story. To do that properly um, in many different markets that are, that are very correlated, right? So you, you can imagine that. Imagine you have two, two shares, one, one share BBW and one share uh, Mercedes. Both are very big German car makers. Uh, both are steel buyers. Both are in the same economy. So it's logical that unless there's major events to a single firm or the other firm, that these prices will probably fluctuate very similarly. Now, uh, those sorts of relationships in complicated products are fairly difficult to, uh, to model. So we actually uh, employ a rather, um, rather reasonable amount of, of researchers really looking at what we call pricing research. So, how does it exactly work? How do these relationships exactly work? And, and then most question for us is how do we price our derivatives uh, efficiently off of these? Um, and that, that's actually fairly, um, a fairly complicated subject uh, on its own. So that's also why we're one of the main sponsors. Many people in this, in this, uh, in this field, very often in, uh, in maths, but also physics, um, at a certain point in their career do think about trading because there's a lot of math actually involved in, uh, in many of the things that we do. But it's a, a very implied sort of math. It's not research. Well, of course, it's research as to how to do it. But there's also a practical side to apply what, whatever you're calculating. And you immediately see if it works or not. Because we, we deploy that math as prices in financial markets. So it's a, it's a very immediate feedback cycle for, uh, for, for the researchers on our side. OK, thanks. And are you yourself involved in applying mathematical methods? No, no. Like I said, I um, used to run the technology side of a quantitative uh, part that we do, so you are somewhat exposed to it. Uh, but my background is not in uh, in math itself, so um, yeah, I'm, I'm not doing any sort of pricing or or, or AI research uh, and the math that comes with it. Okay, thank you. Any further questions, Niels? 
Uh, yeah, I actually have one more thing. So uh, you mentioned the the latency in the networks, and that's improving, improving. And what are the direct effects and consequences of this latency for Optifer in their trading strategies, for example? Yeah, it's, it's exactly what I explained in the presentation. So if um, if we are providing liquidity, so we have prices out there, and we are too slow at repricing them, uh, we will have what, what I mentioned is, is adverse selection. So there will be a, a loss. Uh, a loss-making profit uh, or loss-making enterprise. So, if unless we compete there, or exchanges have the right rules in place, uh, we simply cannot market make. So, in that sense, we have to uh, we have to um, invest as well in in that race. If you look really well in that uh, in that, that picture I showed uh, of the microwave network, you would have seen an Optiver in there. Um, but that for us, it is just so that we can be on par with with the fast people, so we can actually do our job of supplying these uh, these prices to the market. Okay. Well, I see there's one question in the chat, but it's a bit hard to read. Um, um, the company that is the fastest right now would probably try to prevent the government from making regulations, right? Also, they probably have the most money to pay lobbyists. Is this a problem in practice? So I think this is concerning uh, market manipulation by the... Uh, most innovative competitors? Uh, not so much innovative. So if you are the fastest, that, that, that is a profitable business. Um, the question is significance. So you need to be significantly faster to actually profit from it. Um, you actually, if you send an order uh, and there is there's sort of a random ordering as to who wins or who loses, then it's um, being much faster without significance is not much of a, of a benefit. Now, the companies making more money with that um, is not so much a problem actually in reality. So lobbying, uh, as far as I'm aware, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a junior in the industry with only 12 years. Um, I haven't seen very much of that. It is very much a pure, uh, a pure play. So every exchange, as I said, has rules. There are very clear rules how that works, and you have to abide by those rules. And if exchanges see abuse of these rules or completely unfair situations, they will just adapt them. So even though some of the firms making more because they're faster, might not actually gain very much by doing so. Um, besides, you know, a monetary incentive, but it's not that there's a completely unfair playing field at that point. Well, thank you. Uh, then I see that John asks, how do do you see this fair trading uh, implemented? If every trade has to be confirmed to see if everyone is still okay with the price, wouldn't that be would that be not practical and take a long time? Yeah, John is right in that. So the the way uh, most of these systems work is that they give um, a small time benefit to people wanting to change their price. So imagine that we are like a, with the television example, right? Imagine that we are still selling the television at 550, and somebody, uh, sorry, we're still buying at 550, and somebody wants to sell it to us. What happens in practice is that exchanges will slow down the what they call aggressor, so the one taking liquidity, so that if uh, we as the price provider also have a message in flight, we can actually move our price out of the way before the aggressor comes in. So you protect the liquidity, and that is sort of the, the mechanism whereby that works. So there is no such thing as a back and forth communication because that would actually be unfair to the ones taking that liquidity. Because imagine that we are there at a price and somebody wants to wants to um, uh, uh, sell to us, and we have a choice at that point. If the exchange wants to say, "Now we have a buyer or a, uh, we have somebody who wants to sell to you," do you agree with that? That's actually also not fair because then then we have we have a certain choice of, "All oh, right, I want this or don't want this," and I, then I can actually wait with the reply. But it's very complicated. So the best way to do that is just have no information there, but make sure that the, 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 the people providing liquidity are protected from the people taking the liquidity. And that is all to get to that, that one single principle. Right? So only if both, then the trade should occur. So the question is, how can you make a system that is both parties agree? Okay, thank you very much. Um, well, you've given us, a, for me, a new meaning to the word fair trade. <laughs> Um, uh, this was the last question. We are running out of time and I uh, heard you had to leave also. So um, thank you very much for your uh, presentation. And thank you for being here now. 
and then we'll uh, go to have a small break and then we'll continue for our last presentation.
and welcome back. I hope you this last break gave you some final energy to for our last presentation, which is given by Elisabetta Arzakova. She is a PhD student at Leiden University, and she uh, has uh, several research areas uh, where she's working on now statistical mechanics, probability theory, and dynamical systems. But now she is uh, going to tell us all about uh, domino tilings. So, uh, Elisabetta, let's hear it. My name is Elisabetta Arzakova. I am a PhD student in Leiden University. Today we're going to talk about domino tilings, and in particular we will see if we can find the limits. I would like to start the talk about the tilings, uh, mentioning a famous Dutch artist, Maurits Cornelis Escher. So he used tilings a lot in his artwork, and I would like to use his artwork as to explain what a tiling is. So let us look at the left picture of the slide. As we can see, the whole region is covered with two repetitive shapes of birds, a blue bird and a white bird. That's exactly what a tiling is. So a tiling is a covering of some certain region with repetitive tiles so that every point is covered by exactly one tile. That means that there cannot be any gaps between the tiles, but also tiles cannot overlap. So on the right picture, we see another example of a tiling. So in this picture, uh, there are eight tiles and all of them are heads, as, as, as you can see. They perfectly cover the whole square. So um, we can encounter tilings not only in art, but also in our everyday life. For instance, when we walk on the pavement, we work on tilings. And also when we enter the kitchen, the wall in the kitchen is also covered in tiles. But the mathematicians also find tilings a very interesting subject. So let us, um, let us uh, talk about what kind of questions are of interest for mathematicians when we talk about tilings. So imagine we're given some certain region of a plane. So the first natural question would be, can we tile a given region with the tiles that we are provided? So here the answer would be either yes or no. So if the answer is yes, that means that we have to come up with some example of a tiling. If the answer is no, that means we have to come up with some smart argument to uh, explain to our uh, friends why there is no tiling. So imagine that the answer to this question is yes. Then a natural follow-up question would be to understand how many tilings there are um, of a certain region. So surprisingly, the answers can be really, really large. And that means that uh, in many cases, we are provided with a very big pool of possible tilings. So imagine we're talking to someone who is really interested in probability theory. Then this person might ask, uh, what does a typical tiling look like? And what I mean by this is the following. So imagine we have really lots of tilings of some certain region, 100 tilings. What usually happens is that say 95 of them will have some common feature. So then we might be interested in identifying this feature and also identifying how many tilings out of all share this feature. So today we're going to discuss how to find the limits. And that means that instead of just one region, we can actually consider a sequence of regions where they grow in size. And then we can ask the first three questions again, not about one region, but about this sequence. Can we tile each of them? And uh, how does the number of ways to tile them change since they are growing? And what does a typical tiling look like? So let us now look at these questions a bit closer. So in my talk, I will be uh, only discussing the domino tilings. So a domino is a game when players are provided the so-called domino tiles, and they have to place them on the table according to some certain rules. And so the player who cannot place their tiles anymore loses. So the game is so iconic that the domino pizza took domino as their symbol and as their name. So probably everyone knows what a domino tile looks like. So when we talk about tilings, we are not actually interested in the numbers that stand on the domino. We're rather interested in the shape. And the shape, as you can see, is two by one rectangle. So in this talk, we're going to discuss how to tile certain regions of a plane with such domino tiles. 
So the first question, as we mentioned, would be about the existence of a tiling. And I would like to uh, give you such a small uh, brain teaser here. So imagine that we have a chessboard and the two opposite uh, corners are missing. So can we tile the remaining region with dominoes? So when I encounter these types of problems, I'm usually quite suspicious that the answer is no. So the first argument that I would consider is the following. We can only tile a region which has an even area, right? Because the area of every domino is also even. However, it's quite easy to see in this example that the number of remaining squares is still even. So we need to come up with a further argument. So if we think a bit harder, we might notice that every domino tile covers two adjacent squares. That means one of the squares that is covered is black and the other one is white. That means that we can only cover a region which is uh, made of squares if it has equal number of black tiles and white tiles. As we see on this example, the two white uh, squares are missing, which suggests that this region cannot be covered with domino tiles. Imagine now that we have a normal chessboard without missing corners. In how many ways can we tile that? So surprisingly, the problem becomes quite difficult and the answer would be a bit short of 13 million. Not very easy to come up on yourself. So on the table, on this slide, I provide you with the number of tilings of uh, chessboards, which increase in size. So the idea might be to find the limit here. However, as you can see, the numbers grow very fast. So it is clear that they will not converge to any limit. They really go to infinity. However, what mathematicians do in these situations would be to come up with some smart renormalization. For instance, we can take logarithms of these numbers and see what the asymptotic behavior would be. Maybe these numbers would converge to something. Let's see. So in order to understand the limiting behavior of such sequences, it would be nice to uh, have some formula with which we can obtain these numbers so that we can understand how fast they grow. So a famous Dutch mathematician, Piet Kastelein, found such formula. So on the screen, you can see a formula of AMN, where A is the number of tilings of M times N chessboard. And it is given by quite a peculiar formula. So why I find this peculiar? First of all, it is clear that the number of tilings, AMN, should always be an integer. And a priori from this formula, it is not clear that the number where we multiply some cosines is an integer. However, it is always an integer. Moreover, as we already discussed, it is not possible to tile a region which has an odd area. So that means that if we choose both M and N to be odd, it will not be possible to cover such a rectangle. So Magically, this formula will give you zero if the input is both odd numbers. So using this formula now, we could analyze the limiting behavior of the growing regions. So now we move to the third question. So what would be the typical tiling? And uh, I would like to um, present you with this problem using a famous example of Aztec diamond. So an Aztec diamond is a region which is formed by a lot of squares and it is itself a square, but it's rotated 45 degrees. So it stands on its corner. So uh, here I present you a typical tiling of this region. So the horizontal dominoes I colored either in blue or in red and the vertical dominoes I colored e either in uh, green or in uh, yellow. So as we can see, uh, there is some certain color pattern on this picture. So we can clearly see that there is something uh, which we call Arctic Circle in the middle, where the behavior is rather random. And there are the so-called frozen regions. So as you can see in the corners, it's quite easy to predict what a color of a tile will be. So from a probability point of view, if we need to bet on the color that will be on a typical tiling in the corner, it would be quite easy for us to predict what it is. However, if we asked about the same thing in the middle, that's not so easy, that's completely random. So in fact, this picture holds much more to it. In fact, it's not 
only, uh, in fact, we can view this as a forming of a crystal. So imagine that each domino tiling is a molecule and the molecule has to find its way in the crystal, thus forming it. So that's exactly what happens here. And here we're actually presented with three physical states of the crystal. So in the corners, we see the solid state or the frozen state. So uh, the structure of the molecules here is very rigid and it's very easy to predict what it will be. Then on the rim of the so-called Arctic Circle, we see that the structure becomes much less rigid. However, there is still some certain pattern that we can observe. And this corresponds to the liquid state of the matter. In the center of the circle, however, the behavior becomes completely random. And this corresponds to the gas state of the matter. Another observation would be the following. So what we call an Arctic circle here is in fact not a circle. So we can easily see it on the picture that it resembles more a uh, uh, square with uh, rounded up corners. And this is not a coincidence. In physics, this is called the wolf shape. So the wolf shape is something that we might observe in the real life. So for instance, if you have a perfect cube of ice and you leave it in some warm place, so then the corners of this cube will, became, will disappear with time and they will become a bit rounded. So this shape is exactly the wolf shape that we saw on the Aztec diamond. The wolf shape formally is the shape that minimizes the total surface free energy of a crystal. So we talked about tilings, uh, domino tilings on some regions which are formed by squares. In fact, we can view this as a tiling of a graph. So let's look at the picture on the top. So on the left, we are presented with a tiling of a chessboard with dominoes. However, we can view the chessboard as a graph where each square will be a vertex and two vertices are connected by an edge if they share an edge on the chessboard. So you can see this happening on the picture on the top. However, this holds much more meaning to a mathematician because that means that we can tile not only square uh, formed regions, but any graph. For example, we can cover the honeycomb graph as is shown on the picture on the bottom. Normally, the tiling of a graph then would be a subset of edges of the graph such that each vertex is covered exactly once. And this we can see on the picture on the bottom. So on the honeycomb uh, graph, we selected edges smartly so that each vertex is covered exactly once by the red edges. So in this context, we are again interested in the same questions that we discussed before. For example, how many tilings there are of such a region? And this can be answered uh, by studying the so-called partition function. So the formula we can see on the bottom of the page. So let me note that on the honeycomb graph, there are three types of the edges according to their orientation, A, B, and C. And so the partition function is the formal sum, which consists of monomials and each monomial represents exactly one possible tiling of this region. So what I mean by that is the following. We select a tiling and then we have to add a monomial to our sum. The monomial would be of the following form. It will be a to the power of n a where n a is the number of edges of type a that participate in the given uh, tiling. Then b to the power of nb, where nb is the number of edges of type b that are in the given tiling, and the same for c. So in fact, here we can treat a, b, and c as the weights of these edges. So for example, if we set all weights of edges to be 1, then it is quite easy to see that the partition function z will be just a number, and this number will be exactly the number of domino tilings of this region. However, uh, for some certain problems, we can also select weights to be different from one. For example, some edges are more expensive to use than the other ones. And then the partition function will have some different meaning according to our problem. So uh, as we discussed, we are interested in the increasing size of the region. So in order to understand in how many ways we can, tile, we can tile increasing regions, it would be again smart to write the partition function for each of them. 
However, it seems like a daunting task because the region becomes larger and the partition function probably becomes more and more difficult to write. But we have a shortcut here. In fact, we can write the partition function in a unified way. So, as you can see on the top of the slide, there is a formula for the partition function, which consists of four summons. So, each summon is a um, certain function, pn, evaluated in different points. What is this function, pn? In fact, pn is called the characteristic polynomial of a region of size n. And this one is very easy to derive from the smallest region. So, uh, in the red frame, we can see the formula of how to derive it. What's very interesting about it is that the polynomial P is the main player of this game. Because if we know the polynomial P, which is the so-called characteristic polynomial of the smallest region possible, we can derive the characteristic polynomial of the bigger region and also the partition function. What's also important and interesting about this formula is that the P is the polynomial. And then we multiply many copies of it, where we plug in for the variables the roots of unity, so complex numbers. And then we see the outcome of this formula. So it turns out that the outcome is also a polynomial also with integer coefficients, which is not obvious from the formula, but this is how it happens. So here I provide you with some examples of characteristic polynomials for different um, graphs. So for hexagonal graph and for square graph. For square graph, you can also think about it as a chessboard that we already discussed. So as we can see from this slide, it is very important to uh, analyze the behavior of characteristic polynomials. So let us now look at the coefficients of the characteristic polynomial. So the first observation that we have here is that the polynomial z and the polynomial pn have the same coefficients. That's actually not surprising because, as you can see, the formula of z of the size n depends uh, is actually a sum of four copies of pn. So in fact, these copies are organized in a way so that the absolute values of coefficients of the partition function and the characteristic polynomial are the same. But in characteristic polynomial, you can have negative coefficients. And in partition function, we always want to have them positive. The second observation would be that the coefficient, or rather the absolute value of it, has a physical meaning. In fact, it's a number of tilings of given slope. What do we mean by slope? So remember, on hexagonal lattice, we had three types of edges, A, B, and C. So the coefficient in front of the monomial would indicate the number of possible tilings that uses exactly this number of edges of type A, of type B, and of type C. So this is something that we call the slope. So therefore, it is quite interesting to understand the behavior of the coefficients because it predicts some physical behavior of the change of the tilings. And naturally, if we just take the sum of the coefficients of these functions, it will just indicate the number of tilings in general. So here we already see some result on the limiting behavior of the um, partition function. So such a limit, and here of course we have to uh, scale the partition function down a little bit because it grows very fast, as we already saw, for instance, in the example of the chessboard. So we scale it down by taking the logarithm and dividing it by n squared. But then actually the limit is quite easy to find and it's also expressed with a characteristic function. So let us now look at what happens when the region grows. So the procedure that we saw uh, on the previous slide, when we uh, plugged the roots of unity in the characteristic polynomial and multiplied the copies, we call it the decimation. So let's understand what happens when we decimate some polynomial. So here we take an example of 1 minus x minus y, which is the characteristic polynomial of the hexagonal lattice. So uh, here we have three decimations of this polynomial. First, the zeroth one, so the polynomial itself, then the second decimation and the third decimation. So what we notice first is probably that we start with a polynomial with all coefficients being 1. And already in the third decimation, we have some coefficient whose absolute value is 21. 
That suggests that the coefficients grow quite fast. And in fact, if we uh, write down more decimations of 1 minus x minus y, we will see that this is exactly the case. Secondly, we can see that the number of monomials also grows. And moreover, the power of the monomials grows as well. So on this picture, we depict with a red stars the monomials of the 1 minus x minus y. What I mean by that is the following. So we can view each monomial as a point on the z2 grid. So for example, 1 is x to the power 0, y to the power 0. So this will correspond to the point 0, 0. X is x to the power 1, y to the point 0. So this will correspond to the point 1, 0, and so on. So with red uh, stars, we see the monomials of 1 minus x minus y. And then with the blue stars, we see the monomials of the second decimation. And with the orange monomials, we see uh, the, the monomials, with the orange stars, we see the monomials of the third decimation. So what we observe here is very interesting. So first of all, we see that the shape formed by the stars does not really change. So it was a small triangle, it just increases size, but the shape stays the same. So in order to understand the limit of coefficients or to give any uh, meaning to the limit of coefficients, it's clear that first of all, they grow. So we have to scale them down a little bit. And secondly, we see that their domain kind of grows. So we have also to scale the domain a little bit. So in fact, uh, we have awesome results about the limits of the coefficients. So for example, Sheffield showed that indeed, if we scale down the, um, the absolute value of the coefficients, but also we scale down the powers of the monomials, we indeed obtain the limit of the coefficients. And this limit, uh, which is called surface tension, is a strictly convex function. Then uh, Sheffield, together with his co-authors, Okunkov and Kenyon, actually could express the so-called surface tension using the Ronkin function, which is quite a useful and uh, popular tool in this type of um, problems. So it was, a very big, um, it was a very big result in this area. So let us now look at this surface tension of our favorite polynomial 1 minus x minus y. So it's represented on the picture on the top. So as you can see in its shape, it a little bit resembles a drop of liquid, as we can see on the picture on the bottom. And this is not coincidence. So in fact, this is why it's called surface tension. The shape of this um, object on the top is actually uh, described by very similar law, which also describes the shape of a droplet of any liquid. Uh, so, um, when I started my research, these results were already known. And so then the question which um, appeared interesting to me would be the following. What if we apply the same decimation procedure, but not to the polynomials which arise as characteristic polynomials of a graph, but just to random arbitrary polynomial? So we still experience some very interesting uh, features of such a polynomial, which is represented on, with the formula on the top. So, as we can see, we select some polynomial f, and then we start multiplying copies of it, but not the same copy. Each time we plug in in the variables, we pre-multiply the variables by some root of unity. And then we have a lot of such copies, all possible combinations, we multiply them together. So again, what is very interesting is that we obtain a polynomial with integer coefficients. And here I again um, say that it is a bit unexpected because we were actually pre-multiplying our variables with complex numbers. So in principle, there is no reason that the coefficients will stay integers, but they do. Secondly, the powers of the, pol of the monomials of the resulting polynomial will be divisible by n. And as we already saw, it is maybe something that we could already expect. The coefficients of the nth decimation will grow very rapidly. So can we find the limit of such coefficients? It turns out that we cannot use the same arguments as were used with the domino tilings of the graphs. In fact, it turns out that the proofs 
that we used when we talked about graphs and their characteristic polynomials depended very heavily on the physical nature of such phenomenon, as we already discussed. So each coefficient was the number of tilings of a given slope. And this was very important in the proof. Besides, uh, the domino argument worked only for polynomials of two variables, and not all of them, only the polynomials that arose as the characteristic polynomials of some graph. So, we might ask ourselves, does the same result hold for arbitrary polynomial? And it is quite easy to find a counterexample where there is no limiting behavior for the coefficients. So, as an example, let us take a polynomial x squared minus 2. So here we write down the first five decimations of it. And as you can see, the number of monomials is either 2 or 3. So this middle uh, monomial, we would like to track what happens with its coefficients, because this is exactly the sequence that we want to find the limit of. And as you can see here, it will be 0, 4, 0, 8, 0, and so on. So clearly such a sequence does not have a limit. So as we can see, the coefficient of x to the power of n is blinking. So therefore, it was already clear to us that it's not possible to find a limit in the same sense as Okunkov, Kenyon, and Sheffield did. However, our result is the following. Even though there does not exist a limit in its usual uh, understanding, if we take the convex hull of the coefficients, the limit would exist, the limit of the convex hulls. And this is exactly our result. So I would like to say a couple of words about the proof of such result. So usually with such things, um, when we prove that there exists a limit of something, we usually prove that there exists an upper bound and a lower bound. And if we show that they coincide, that means that this is exactly the limit of the sequence. So in this type of problems, finding an upper bound is usually not that difficult. However, finding a lower bound was a real challenge for us. Why? Well, we already saw on one example that there can be a blinking behavior. That means that your sequence suddenly goes very uh, low. So this is uh, the nature of why lower bounds are usually quite difficult to find. However, we managed. I would like to finish this talk with a quote of Albert Einstein. The difference between genius and stupidity is that genius has his limits. So I wish that we all find our limits like geniuses do. Thank you. Well, thank you, uh, Elisabeth, uh, for this very interesting presentation. I thought it also showed that mathematics is also fun and uh, um, but I was wondering about your research, what the possible practical application of your research uh, could be. Yeah, thank you very much for the question. So since I work in pure mathematics, it's always a tricky uh, question to ask what the practical applications are. Hopefully in 100 years, people will find some practical applications <laughs> to this uh, well, subject, but so far, um, I could try to explain a bit more connection with physics, but I think it's not really a um, serious practical application. I think it's just for fun. Okay, well, well, fun is also a good reason, I think. <laughs> so, uh, Hugo, you have another question. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, ac I actually have two things, maybe first. There was the Aztec diamond and then there were some yellow and green and blue and red, I think, who were horizontal. But is there a difference between the yellow and green while they are the same orientation or were they just for two? Uh, yeah, so I can show the slide, I think, just to... Uh, that would be great, yeah. That would be great, okay. <laughs> I'm sharing my screen with a little bit of luck. Yeah, there we go. Yeah, it works. Um, so, Aztec diamond. So, there are four colors because, in principle, there are four uh, orientations. So, it's like uh, facing up, facing down, facing left, facing right. However, for the purpose of my talk, facing left and facing right did not make any difference. 
But for people who study Aztec diamond, they really find a lot of fascinating properties of the styling, and therefore they're also interested in this type of orientations. Oh, okay, this makes sense to me. Yeah. I think, yeah, okay, thank you so much. And also, what was a bit unclear maybe to me was about the, the uh, decimation, because I didn't exactly get w what you did to obtain those decimations of the, the formulas. I think, yeah, somewhere you showed the examples of the decimations for some polynomial, and then it was, I didn't totally get how you computed them. Okay, so now I'm sharing a screen, and on the top of the screen there is a formula of how to obtain the nth decimation of f. So basically what happens is the following. We fix the number n, and then we consider all n roots of unity. So there are n of them. And then we start pre-multiplying the variable by these roots of unity. If the, you have more than one variable, there will be different roots of unity. And you take all possible combinations. So for instance, you pre-multiply the first variable by the fourth, um, fourth root of unity of order n, and the second variable by the seventh, and so on. So very different combinations. And then you take the product of all these possible combinations. So you obtain a, a product of really a lot of polynomials. So that's why it also grows. Yeah, it makes sense, I think. So you also multiply the, the complex numbers, right? And it's just lucky that it's real numbers, or...? Yes, that's exactly the trick. Yes, yes, that's exactly what you mentioned, but now I get it, finally. Okay, thank <laughs> you. Well, then, yeah. uh, then this was a very good question. Uh, I don't see any questions in the chat yet. Maybe that's because you were very clear in explaining, or maybe people are getting tired a bit after this uh, full day of presentations. So, well, maybe later they will have uh, questions and they will email you. Your presentation will all be also be placed on the uh, internet so everybody can have uh, another look. So, well, thank you very much for your uh, presentation and for being uh, willing to have this final presentation on this uh, day. Thank you very much for the invitation. It was really nice to participate. Yes, great. Well, yes. Then I think we uh, almost came to the, to the end of this day. And uh, Hugo, uh, I think your, you and your team did an excellent job. Oh, thank you. Despite some uh, technical uh, problems we have, but well, it wasn't really your fault and not everything was in the circle of influence of your, uh, of your committee. So. Well, you did a, go a good job, I think. Do, do you, yeah. maybe you want to mention everybody who... Yeah, uh, yeah, of course. <laughs> I mean, we, we didn't hope we had that much work today, right? Because we really did a lot of things in advance, but still there are some people from the committee who didn't see today here in the studio, uh, Lavinia and Margriet and Mike. And they did a really good job today after the behind the screens because, yeah, we hoped there wasn't much to do, but they had to fix some some problems and they did a really great job and I really want to thank them also and the other committee members, they did an, did an awesome job. Yes, so, I saw some yeah. stress behind the screens today, but I think eventually it all turned out uh, very well, so... Um. Yeah, of course, I mean, with these online things you can always have some small hiccups along the way, but this just happens. We will upload the full uh, symposium later on YouTube and then we will just cut those parts out so it will look like everything was very <laughs> smooth. <laughs> so. <laughs> this, this will be uploaded later. Uh, I also, also also want to thank the people from Lisa that helped us assi assisted us with the studio. They weren't here today, but on two test days they were Lisa here. Lisa is a abbreviation of something. Yeah, I think not so. Not for people not known here, or it's <laughs> the background technical committee uh, on the university. Or yeah, for example, but I think they also have the library and stuff, but I'm okay, not sure so what it stands for, yeah. so sorry. But <laughs> also the people, especially from the studio, they helped uh, us yeah. a lot and they, they explained everything to us. So it was really nice that we could sit here and I think it looked beautiful, the studi yeah, studio I, today. I've, so. Well, I I've have had much experience in sitting in studios, but it was perfect. So. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah, me neither, me neither, but I, I liked it too. Yeah, and finally, I want to thank you. We have a lot of gifts for you, I think. We have, of course, the, you can get the goodie bag from me, but there's also, I can just show it to you. 
We have the wine, of course, which is really, uh, Thank really you very good wine. Much. I hope you Thank like you wine. For, yes, I like wine. <laughs> and and <laughs> the abacus also is really... Yeah, uh, I, I already have one because I was in the abacus board. It's a bigger one. But oh, yeah, uh, the bigger one, yeah. Uh, and they also gave me... Uh, uh, we had this... Uh, guide how to use it so uh, yeah exactly <laughs> nice so nice I, uh, I, I and some this, more uh, this stuff. is the pocket size <laughs> yeah i, I <laughs> like you. it i like it i like it you can just display it in your home right and yes. everybody will see that you're uh, i yes. think it's a nice memory always. yeah thank you thank you yeah you're welcome and i think this is kind of the end right yes. of the symposium so thank you all the audience and see yeah. you next year uh. yeah <laughs> hopefully uh, next year well, yeah, thank you all again for watching the Symposium 2021, and uh, this is it. Thank you. Goodbye. Let me say yeah! Sky. You try to diss me cause I sell out I'm making techno and I am proud